Content warning. The following video contains discussion of topics such as racism, forced drug use, ace and transphobia, student abuse, animal cruelty, and circumventing consent in the Adventure Zone graduation. Hello, I am my brain, and I want to talk about graduation. If you don't know what that is, to put it concisely, graduation is the third season of the tabletop RPG series, The Adventure Zone, made by the McElroy brothers on the MaxFun network. You got that? Cool. Go listen to it before watching this. Should only take you like 40-ish hours. Go do that, then come back here. I'll wait. Oh, cool, you're back. Holy shit, it was bad, right? That crap with the wheelchair and the mind control and capitalism? I'm so glad you spent the equivalent of a full work week listening to the show, because if you didn't, then a lot of what I'm gonna talk about might not make sense at first blush. It's so poorly written and thought out that a lot of it's gonna sound like hyperbole. I assure you, it's not. And hey, if you listened to it and actually enjoyed it, that's cool too. I mean, I'm going to be shitting on it for the next, oh my god. But genuinely, if this show makes you happy, I'll fully admit that you're better off than me. Having more things to enjoy in life can only be positive. Having said that, I personally enjoy punching up on successful but ultimately mediocre white dudes. That is my bliss. The McElroys are my Paul Blart mall cop too, and if you understood that reference, then you know that I know what I'm talking about. Not only am I going to dunk on the way they play, I'm also going to swish on the bad writing and dribble the pacing. Okay, I don't really know basketball all that well, but you get the point. There's a lot of bad to cover, so I'm going to talk in broad terms. And if you really hate what I have to say, this will probably be the only time I do this. So you only have to be mad for- Oh my god. Oh, and uh, also I've seen comments about how I should just let people like things and all that. I always thought that was a weird thing to say because I never assumed that I had the authority to decide what people like. I have no power over anything that other people do. I'm not God or your dad. I enjoy Jolly Ranchers. I wouldn't stop liking them if my friends said they didn't like them, let alone strangers on the internet. That doesn't make sense to me. If somebody listens to me talk about how much I don't like a D&D podcast and it makes them not like it, I think that just means they agree with me. Now, I know for a fact you've already listened to the whole show in its entirety, because I know you're not a liar. But I am going to give a super basic summary of what happens over the course of the series, just for my own sake. Graduation takes place in the world of Nua, following our three player characters of Fitzroy Maplecourt, Argonaut Keen, and Fearbulg as they try to go on adventures at Hieronymus Wiggenstaff's School for Heroism and Villainy. Heroes and villains are supposedly important in this world, because they've been the alternative for war for the last 200 years. More on that later. The players themselves start off as sidekicks, but we'll see later that that's rather pointless to differentiate. Their first semester there, they go to a single class each, meet far too many NPCs, and beat the shit out of a bear that the school refuses to let die. This two week long semester is capped off when they go on a field trip to stop an interdimensional monster that ends in the most boring way possible. Oh, and uh, Fearbulg is being mind controlled or something. It is also within the first semester that Travis realizes that the entire conceit of the show isn't working and they immediately have to change shit. After the field trip, it's time for summer break, and the players get assigned to clear out a hospital of its imp problem. They do this because they literally had no desire to do anything other than sit in their room and wait for classes to start. During the hospital mission, they get a clue from an NPC that got turned into a bird, more on that later, that one of the headmasters of the school is the one mind-controlling Fearbulk. Then a woman named Althea shows up as well. She's important until she's not anymore. Anyway, they confront the mind-controlling headmaster and get a mission from him to get a magic centaur apple because he needs it to change his brother back into a real boy after turning him into a dog so he could hide him from a demon who's trying to kill him. This turns out to be a lie, but let's not get hung up on that now. 
So the players go on another mission to stop two tribes of centaurs from killing each other because a minion of the demon stole one of the two apples. We're going to breeze past the fact that the demon was the one who planted the apple tree, mostly because the story breezes past it as well. After an uncomfortable amount of white savior coded hijink, they cut off the minion's hand and get the apple debacle settled, after telling a bunch of native coded characters that they need to grow up. They go back to Higglemas, but the demon, named Grey, has already beaten up the headmasters, but conveniently didn't kill them even though that's what he wanted to do for the last 50 years. Grey then decides that three students who have not finished a single year of school are in charge of gathering an army to fight his demon horde in six months. The players try to do a couple of recruitment things, but Grey fucks with their efforts, like at every turn, which seems counterproductive considering that Grey is the one that told him to do it in the first place. They eventually just decide to try and assassinate him before the deadline. But then they have their dreams invaded by another interdimensional being called Chaos. Chaos shows them the future where they do beat Grey in this war, and all the rewards they get for playing along. This does nothing because, shockingly, the players want to avoid a demon war killing a bunch of innocent people. Then this racist guy with no canonical skin tone named the Commodore shows up, is racist for a little bit, and then is found guilty in a murder trial several hours later. This doesn't matter though because he works for Grey and he just teleports him out. After that courtroom drama, they have more chaos dreams. Chaos reiterates that they gotta do the war, which the players ignore again because fuck that. Fetzrod goes and recruits a necromancer named Gordy, which he is able to do because his daughter Rainier wants to do the fuck on him. Oh yeah, Fearbulg's dad died during that whole thing. Ha, <laughs> dead dad. Anyway, the players go to a place called the Godscar Chasm to try and get some agency in the story. They talk to Chaos, oh by the way there's two of them now called Chaos and Order, that's not important, who says there needs to be a war because he's really sad that people have been living peacefully. Apparently he can't clock out of his shift until they're no longer living in a utopia. Chaos then closes the Godscar Chasm because Travis can't narratively defend war crimes. The players hatch a plan to cause enough chaos in the world on their own, without hurting anyone, that they might change their minds. They go on a heist to destroy some magical filing cabinets that apparently contains all the capitalism in the world. The highlight of this whole ordeal is Argo getting a haircut over the course of two episodes. This arc lasts four actual months of real world time and nearly one fifth the runtime of the series. What comes of it? Nothing. Travis literally teleports them to the war after they finish the heist and it affects nothing because of course it doesn't. The last four episodes are them eventually winning the war and going off to be successful capitalists. Fitzroy becomes a lawyer, Fearbolt becomes an accountant, and Argo notably makes a racist cruise line in his story wrap-up. Now, go back and imagine me spending more than 40 hours telling you all this over the course of 16 months. That's graduation. One last thing I gotta say before we really dig in. I cannot emphasize how difficult it's going to be for me to not go on wild tangents of interconnected bullshit. I'm going to talk about the setting, and it is taking all of my willpower to not get sidetracked about all the stupid shit they get up to in all these places. Anyway, Graduation is advertised as a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons game, so obviously the story takes place in a fantastical world. Enter Nua. The setting can be generously called Nebulous. There are places in Nua, certainly, like Hieronymus Wickenstaff's School for Heroism and Villainy located outside the town of Hope and between the Unknown Forest and the God's Car Chasm. I hope you enjoyed that rich tapestry of words just now, because it's all downhill from here when it comes to geographical descriptions. No joke, there are characters later on in the story that talk like aliens because it seems like Travis didn't want to name cities or people that could have easily been used for world building. There are buildings they go to? Like they go to a couple of bars, and a hospital, and the apparently one store that sells magic items in the entire world. There's also the Heroic Oversight Guild. That's described as big, and has banners, and ramps. I think the basement has stalactites for some reason. Uh, they go to a lot of forests. Those are easy to describe because you just talk about trees and whatnot. The world is a bit hazy because the players either are not given opportunities to travel on their own, or they just don't take the initiative to explore the world outside the school. There are multiple named characters that are associated with the Royal Navy, but we never go to the ocean. Are they close to the ocean? Do they have to travel a long way if not? How do people travel normally? All the places the players go are vaguely alluded to by measures of travel time and not actual distance. The travel time is always a day or less, no matter if they're on horses, in a wagon, or riding flying pegasi. The places they need to be are always... Not like that matters at all, because eventually the players just start getting teleported directly where they need to go. Which is great when you have difficulty planning encounters, but can cause some hiccups and continuity here and there. Like when they get teleported to the Heroic Oversight Guild from the school, which is described as being two weeks away, but there are characters who clearly don't have access to teleportation that go from the school to the guild in less than a few days. It's almost like Travis saying that it takes two weeks to get there, 
was put in as a justification for the players to accept help from Grey because they thought there was a time crunch. But then that obstacle can be circumvented by his own characters because he's the kind of person who thinks dungeon masters can win at D&D. And while we're on the subject of continuity, why is there even a royal navy if there hasn't been a war in over 200 years? On top of that, one of the teachers at the school is referred to as a war tactics teacher. Why is there a teacher at the magic school whose whole goal is to make heroes and villains so there doesn't have to be war anymore? And another thing, I- <sighs> Sorry, got off track there for a moment. The story starts off at the school and even spends about half its runtime there, so it's clear that Travis would be so decadent with the flavor text. The school is pretty self-explanatory from its name and its inspiration. Isn't that right, Travis? Yeah, so from the beginning, I mean, this was originally designed as a kind of spoof of, uh, I hate, and I hate that this is true, but of Harry Potter. Fuck turfs. Every day of the week. To Travis's credit, later on the school is meant to function as more of a college rather than a regular school. So it's implied, not very well mind you, that everyone there is an adult already. But even that gets called into question because there are moments in the story that really only work if they're in more of a high school setting. You know, where students are more beholden to teachers. They talk about hall passes, getting detention, and not to mention one of the main characters, Fitzroy Maplecourt, is at the school really against his will because he got kicked out of his last school for accidentally using magic on a teacher. It is hammered home in the early episodes that he doesn't want to be there and he just wants to go back to his old school. This kind of character beat would make sense if they were in high school, where students have considerably less control over their education, but that's not how college works. If Fitzroy is an adult in college, then he could just leave if he doesn't like it there. I'm not even gonna get into the fact that the headmaster gets to pick and choose whether he gets to be a hero or a villain, because that's also not how college works. School curriculum aside, something we have to touch upon in detail is what the school is meant to do for the world itself. Hieronymus Wiggenstaff's School of Heroism and Villainy is meant to turn its student body into heroes, villains, and the sidekicks that help them. Help them with what? I don't know, and neither does anybody on this show because we never see them do anything as heroes or villains. That's right. The entire conceit of the show never properly manifests. Let me explain. In the first episode of Graduation, we as the audience are introduced to the concept of heroes, villains, and sidekicks. So then I'm going to say that you know this. Um, everybody knows this. So basically the way that this world works is that there are people who are hired to be villains and people who are hired to be heroes in a town, in a city, in a kingdom, right? And then the battles that they wage, quote unquote, the, you know, the their antics, their stories raise the profile of the kingdoms. But the Heroic Oversight Guild exists to make sure that heroes don't start taking bribes or hurting people or anything like that, and that um, villains don't hurt too many people and keep it to like injuries instead of like killing and that it's it kind of becomes a very much like uh almost looney tunes esque battles back and forth to make them more showy rather than actually having any kind of end goal so right out of the gate we are told in no uncertain terms that heroes and villains are more for show than anything travis goes on to even remark that it has very little to do with any kind of morality we are told in the very first episode that this heroes and villain stuff is just an excuse to have fun but then the second episode rolls around. There used to be a time when kingdoms were constantly competing to outdo one another. Sometimes it was with lavish festivals, and sometimes with unnecessary wars. The royals never thought of the impact this had on their coffers until it was too late. These were highly unstable times. Kingdoms rose and fell in the spans of decades. Workers went unpaid, and whole villages would starve. Then began the golden age of accounting. Kingdoms, guided by teams of accountants, began to think in terms of cost and benefit. Rather than hurling money around, they spent strategically and invested wisely. Wages were paid on time. Funds were set aside to cover those who found themselves unable to work and infrastructure was maintained. This stability saved us, and so a new system was put in place, the system of heroes and villains. 
This system created exciting stories and spectacular battles while still keeping an eye on the bottom line. Oh, okay. Seems to be very important, actually. This hero and villain thing has been put in place to alleviate problems such as war, poverty, starvation, and crumbling infrastructure. I need to put emphasis on this because I'm going to refer to it a lot. This system was put in place because it actively solved the problems of war, poverty, starvation, and crumbling infrastructure in Nua. And really, the only listed downside was that it got so nice that everyone got bored. Except there was a downside. It was incredibly boring. And because they were bored, they made heroes and villains for the merch opportunities. Yes, really. The heroes and villains became celebrities, and kingdoms boomed thanks to the tourism and merch sales. All right, two episodes in, and the show is shaping up to be a pretty lighthearted adventure. Go to school, make friends, hell, even get a t-shirt with your face on it. It seems that all of society's problems are already solved, and all we gotta do is have fun with it. Too bad things aren't as they seem on the surface. The having fun part, I mean. Throughout the show, there aren't really any societal problems to speak of. I mean, they do speak of them a little bit, but they don't hold up to any scrutiny after the fact. So, how does this hero and villain hoopla supposed to play out anyway? Well, allow me to regale you with a metaphorical reenactment. Hello, Hieronymus is plumbing and piping. How can I help you? Hello, yes, I have a problem with a leak in my kitchen sink. Could you send a plumber to come fix it? No problem, ma'am. We'll send out a good plumber of ours. George, him and Evil Greg will fix your problem. Oh, thank you. That would be... Hang on. Who was that second one called? Evil Greg? Yes. Is that his full name, or...? Nope, that's his job title. Why is he called Evil Greg? Oh, that's easy. So Good George is gonna come fix your sink. Okay. And Evil Greg is gonna try and stop him. He'll probably try and scam more money out of you as well. Excuse me? That's his job, ma'am. He plays an important role in making sure there's drama. Why would I want drama? I just want my sink fixed. It's much easier to sell the novelty t-shirts that way, ma'am. There's novelty t-shirts? Who's buying shirts for... Ugh, never mind. Look, I don't want Evil Greg. But if I don't send Evil Greg, who will represent the people who don't want your sink fixed? What are you talking about? No one here wants the sink to stay broken. I'm the only party involved here. And who in their right mind would want to be represented by someone calling themselves evil anyway? I'm sorry, ma'am. If you want good George, Evil Greg is part of the deal. That's policy. If Evil Greg shows up, I'm not paying you. Oh, uh, I didn't think this business plan through. It's very obvious that you didn't, yes. And scene. Did you see how quickly the premise crumbled under the slightest amount of pressure? It's like that raccoon that tried to wash cotton candy in a puddle. Like, like if, if you, you cry, cry every time. time. The same happens when the players go on their first mission. They spend the first three episodes learning about why the heroes and villains are important. They spend time training. They spend hundreds of gold pieces getting magical items to help them be heroes and villains. And what happens during the first mission? Um, if you think about it, our end goals don't contradict one another, perhaps. At least for this first, uh, information gathering section, we could work together. Nothing. Not a zilch. Narratively speaking, this entire premise is dead on arrival. They do nothing with it in this mission, the mission after this, or even the last mission. You can't even blame it on the players starting out as sidekicks, because the only other hero and villain mission they go on, Fitzroy had already been promoted to villain. The only characters that did proper hero and villain missions are Travis's NPCs. But even they don't do hero and villain stuff in the show. They're only allowed to do it as part of their backstory. I cannot describe how buck wild it is that in a show that was fucking advertised and built up with this heroes and villains thing, a hero never actually fights a villain. That's like a D&D &D campaign being advertised and built up around space battles or some shit, and then they never even go to space. Sure, you get to meet astronauts who have been to space, but they only get to talk about it in the past tense. This whole series is a bit like space if you think about it. It's mostly empty with occasional pockets of hot gas. What we got instead was pretty basic D&D &D fodder. There's a monster, go take care of it. There's some demons, go take care of it. There's a tribe dispute, go take care of it. I'm not dissing regular dungeon crawling missions. In fact, Travis and I agree it was literally the best part of the show. In, um, in Mission Impossible, where Ian the Imp, like, you guys killed another imp so hard that Ian decided to stop being evil and take up cheesemongering. And, like, that, that made me really happy. It would be better if Travis could actually run a decent dungeon, but we'll burn that bridge once we cross it. Hey, by the way, the best episode was called Mission Impossible. It was episode 8 and 9. There are 38 episodes in this series. Kind of funny how the high point of the show isn't even a quarter through the series. That seems like a bad sign. Oh well, there's more problems, logistical and narrative, with how heroes and villains work. 
but we'd be better off explaining those things while talking about the characters that fill the setting. Not the main characters just yet. They'll all be getting their own designated chapters. Oh my god, there are so many side characters. And I'm not talking about incidental characters like Bandit Number 5 or Nameless Local Number 41. I'm talking about named, inexplicably detailed characters that have no bearing on the story because Travis spent all of his prep time making them. It's so bad that they even acknowledge it themselves. Because it was a school, I was so worried about it feeling empty. And so, like, I had all these teachers and NPCs and other students and stuff in my head because I wanted it to feel fully populated, right? Like, right. there's a lot of people here, and, oh, who teaches this, and who teaches this, and who teaches this? And I think in worrying so much about that, I tried so hard right at the beginning to make it feel populated that it was just way too fucking many characters. Um, Thank you, user Star Keaton, for making a comprehensive list of graduation NPCs so that we may all suffer properly. If I were to be lenient and take out any character that had really basic Pokemon names like Ogre or Satyr, that would still leave over 80 named characters. Jiminy Christ. This show is only 38 episodes long, which averages more than two new characters per episode. That is an exhausting amount of people to remember. It's also detrimental to the plot because the players themselves can't keep track. Oh, fuck. I mean, that's just not his name. It's just Zorn. His name is Zorn Zorn. Zorn. Who's Gordy? Gordy, Gordy is the was... Lich King. <laughs> this is embarrassing. Dang. I know this happens a lot. Gordy's the Lich King, right? That's yes. Uh huh. Rainier's dad. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah! I'm finally getting it. <laughs> can't you can't introduce these characters months ago and expect me to keep up with you? I've been talking tapestry. about him for the last three episodes. Me, he I'm... just opened a portal for you ten minutes ago. I am now going to go through this list of side characters and talk about the important ones. I'm also going to talk about a few that are so bad it's worth talking about. Hey, it's me, Gary. Gary, or should I say the Garys, are a hive mind of sentient gargoyles that live on school grounds. They act as a messaging system for the school faculty as well as the players. Even though they're described as a hive mind, Travis clearly didn't want to deal with any of the spooky ramifications of what that entails. This means that each Gary is unique and has their own personality. There's Cool Gary, Pocket Gary, Regular Gary, uh, Malibu Barbie Gary. To be honest, the gimmick isn't played out all that well. He really should have committed to one or the other. Either make them a singular hive mind, or actually that's exactly what he should have done because the alternative would be to have even more characters. Gary is useful. He acts as communicator between characters. They connect with Fearbulk on a personal level, and they do help out in the final battle against Chaos and Order. And Gary is also in charge of recapping the episodes. Hey, it's me, Gary. Hey, everybody, it's me, Gary. Hey, it's me, Gary. Hey, it's me, Gary. Hey, it's me, Gary. Previously on the Adventure Zone graduation. That wasn't always the case. The first nine episodes, the recaps were more or less just snippets of audio from the previous episode, supplemented by Travis narration here and there. Initially, they're honestly not that bad. Instead of pulling audio clips, the recaps became Travis doing a character voice, describing the important things that happened. It's a change that makes sense on paper. You could probably save a lot of time editing if you just quickly summarize in one go, as opposed to scrubbing for relevant clips. And if there was ever a character, it would make sense to know what's happening around a magic school. It would be the magic hive mind gargoyle. Having said that, this change in presentation comes with a few issues, to say the least. First of all, it makes the recaps another opportunity for Travis to monologue, and lord knows we don't need more of that. Second, the recaps themselves take a dive in terms of quality and relevance. When it was the audio clips, you knew for certain that these moments were relevant to what's happening. But when Gary took over, the recaps could end up repeating things we as the audience already knew, leave out pretty important details, be factually wrong in the canon of the show, and later on even spoil reveals. That last part is not a lie. A character has her identity revealed to the audience before it's revealed to us in the show. Gary spoiled a cliffhanger before the episode even started. Wow. Eventually, the recaps actively stopped being useful, because for some wild reason, Travis thought that people were tuning in for the first time 20 episodes into the show. I am not exaggerating. After episode 20, the Gary recaps are mostly just Travis just telling us the basic premise of the story, as opposed to what's actually happening. It's insane. Hey, it's me, Gary. Previously on the Adventure Zone graduation, see, it all started when they enrolled at Hieronymus Wiggenstaff's School for Heroism and Villainy. Turns out, Hieronymus had been replaced by his arch nemesis, Grey the Demon Prince. Hieronymus had been turned into a dog by his brother, Higglemus. 
Gray wanted war, and he was being backed by the embodiments of order and chaos. Can you guess what line that episode is from? Leave in the comments below what you think it is. It's episode 34, what the fuck? And that's when they even bother to have a recap at all. Sometimes Gary disappears for no reason, only to show up again a couple episodes later. He fully acknowledges that he was gone, but there's never an explanation as to why he did that. It's a mess. I've explained Gary. That only leaves, oh for fuck's sake. This is Susan. Susan the Bear a fucked up nightmare that clearly wasn't meant to be. Susan is a sentient, immortal bear that can be found in the training chamber in the school. You see, Travis with his very good boy brain realized while running a combat training scenario with his players how mean it would be for the players to just murder a wild animal. Conveniently ignoring the fact that he's the one who put it there. So, to put everyone's mind at ease, he says this. She feels no pain uh, and will heal up immediately, so do not worry about harming her. No animals are to be harmed in the workings of this school. Uh, in fact, after the battle is done, she won't remember any of this. So... You can tell it's fucked up because Fitzroy immediately clocks it as such. Kind of sad existence Susan leads, if you ask me. It certainly doesn't help that Travis keeps trying to affirm how good she has it. Well, she's well taken care of, and she's fed three meals a day, and she's immortal, so I don't see where the issue lies. It's fucked because there's these skeletons in the chamber as well, and they're very clearly into the fighting and are actively consenting to it which is a stark difference to Susan, for very obvious reasons. Why does she have her memories wiped after every fight, but the skeletons don't? If she feels no pain and can't die, why is she being fed and comforted? Travis attempting to alleviate potential animal abuse imagery instead manifests as a fucking psychological nightmare. Uh, and she collapses to the ground. Uh, you slide off, Argo. And then she immediately rises back up, and now she's more like Winnie the Pooh, seems pretty happy, and heads back into the room, and you see in there... You know, there's a big pool to swim in and a big jar of honey. We get it, Trav. It's smack good. Out of it. It's a good setup for the bear. It's a good setup. She has plenty of room to move around. And you know what else is messed up? Some fans thought it was meant to be intentional foreshadowing. Back when the show was originally airing, there was a couple of fan theories flowing around about how Susan was a regular person, or like a former teacher, that got turned into a bear as a means of imprisonment or punishment. This theory only grew in plausibility when another side character named Leon got turned into an eagle. Oh shit. Susan got turned into a bear. Who was she originally? Who did this to her? What did she know? This is very clearly going to be super important to the plot- Nope, not related. Yes, there were multiple characters that got turned into animals for plot-related reasons, but not Susan. Susan is just a fucked up bear for no discernible reason. Weird, huh? The Unbroken Chain. This really isn't a character per se. It's actually a group of characters, described as a fraternity by Travis, that all serve the same narrative function, which is to be ultimately pointless. To elaborate on the goals of this secret society. Simply put, the Unbroken Chain does what needs to be done whatever that may be. I hope you enjoyed that vague platitude. There's nothing of substance to this organization. It's composed of teachers, and Argo gets to be a part of it. He goes on secret missions off screen in order to join because his mom was a member, but we don't get to see those missions because that would require Travis to actively let his father succeed on his watch, which we'll learn later is a big no-no. Let's see, what else? They're studying the God Scarcasm, which leads to nothing. Oh, uh, they convict the Commodore of murder with no evidence because he's a racist jerk, which leads to nothing. And they disappear from the story until the finale where they stop being a secret organization, because why not? The most charitable reading of their contribution to the story is that sometimes the members gave the players clues for stuff. Stuff that ultimately was rendered pointless by the rushed ending. But at the time, it could have easily been mistaken for being useful. So, good job. Drinio? Rainier is a fellow villain student at the Academy. She's a nice, caring, optimistic necromancer that makes a concerted effort to make Fitzroy and the other main characters feel welcome to a new school. Rainier is a favorite amongst listeners, as well as Travis himself. Not only does she- Anybody want to ask about the chair? Play an important part of the student body, she's also paramount to late show conflicts. Anybody want to ask about the chair? With her connections to her dad's army of skeleton- Anybody want to ask about the chair? Tons, which are- instrumental to anybody want to ask about the goddamn all right fine i'll talk about the wheelchair rainier is in a wheelchair congratulations travis you're such a good boy you did a diversity and we see that you did you can tell travis was excited about it too he gives no time for rainier to you know 
be a character? It's practically her first line of dialogue outside of, so what's your name? Travis has the subtlety of a brick, landing on a bowl made of china. Wait, that's not. He also does the very charming thing of describing the chair more than the person in the chair. Rainer gets described as young and blonde. Whereas her chair, we get to learn about the builder, why it floats, what it's made of, the kind of lights that are installed on it, and all the secret compartments. Because we all know that the chair is actually the interesting part, right? It's not because Travis is playing into a cliche stereotype about people with disabilities. No, 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 no. It's actually factually true that every disabled person is just busting at the seams to talk about their visible medical problems to strangers, even if the player characters did not want to bring it up in the first place. Anybody want to ask about the chair? Go ahead and get that. Out of the way, anybody? I thought it would be fairly impolite. Travis also doesn't even write her disability all that well, to be honest. Canonically, Rainier is an ambulatory wheelchair user. What that basically means is that ambulatory people aren't fully paralyzed, often limited by such things such as chronic issues of fatigue and pain. Does that stop Travis from making Rainier use her chair like a battering ram? Like nobody with chronic fatigue or pain would ever do? Like fuck it does, but no. It's super clear that Rainier would use her one-of-a-kind custom-made magic mobility device as a makeshift door knocker. Top shelf, Travis. Truly, top shelf. Oh, and she's hot for Fitzroy, which is pretty funny because he has never once reciprocated any of her advances and is also asexual. Hey, Travis, your family doesn't want to roleplay romantic relationships with you. Take the hint. Moon. Moon! 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 Right. Uh, uh, fuck, who was that? Uh, fuck. Um, uh, sorry. I got nothing. Hello! Mia Festo! Festo is a fairy that works at the school as a magic teacher. They start out as a supportive, kinda hippy-dippy mentor for Fitzroy at the beginning of his magical journey. Your magic knows you do not love it. Only for them to devolve into the worst I have tenure so fuck off teacher ever. Okay, but how do I get my brain back in that space? Like, now I, I know, know I don't- I don't know, dude! You're the fucking- you I don't know! <laughs> This is Festo. You have changed my life in in incalculable ways, but this is the least helpful you've ever been. Well, as a fairy, my magic is natural. I don't think about. I've never had to worry about it. Right. And right. so, this is. I I know how to do a spell. I don't know how to access my own magic. I mean, stop getting in your own fucking way. I guess. All right. Not only do they seem to become a pessimist out of nowhere, they are the source of Travis's worst character voice ever, bar none. Oh, I see. I'd also like to point out that Festo has the pronouns they, them. Travis has made a concerted effort to include a larger variety of pronouns for his characters in graduation. No harm in that, but if I were just to nitpick a little bit here, Travis, you have this bad habit of only giving those kinds of pronouns to characters that are obviously not human. It seems like only demons, robots, bird people, or fairies get those pronouns, according to Travis. It's reminiscent of those trashy novelty bathroom signs. You know, the ones that equate non-binary people with the Sasquatch. I don't think that was your intention, Travis. Just thought I'd point out that it's not a good look. Anyway, Festo forces his students to take hard drugs, under threat of violence. Drink no, this! Now, no, boys, don't. I've... No, Festo. <laughs> it's drugs! What kind of... I... My... Bo <laughs> Drink it! <laughs> There's another good castle night, like, here. Don't make me magic slap okay. you! I, I drink. Not a lot of good looks when it comes to Festo, huh, Travis? To add to the hilarity of this joke, Fitzroy explicitly states that he does not consent. I drink I drink the drugs under threat, threat of violence from the teacher at this school. <laughs> Teachers forcing drugs onto their students. Comedy. But don't worry, folks. He totally heard the complaints people had and added a content warning after the fact. Content warning. This episode contains heavy drug usage. Yo, big dog. The drug use wasn't the fucking problem. The problem was a teacher forcing a student to take drugs, otherwise they'd hurt them. That's child abuse! That's a different thing. If I made a podcast where a teacher punches a child for his lunch money, the content warning would not be, warning, depictions of children crying. That's not the thing people wanted a warning about, you moron. <sighs> oh well, I guess it's better than nothing. Which is what you would get if you listened to the show on Maximum Fun. Maximum Fun is their home network, but there's no content warning for that episode. It's on Spotify and their homepage, but not their home network. Great job, Travis. Way to make sure your audience's concerns are addressed. Higgle Miss Wiggenstaff. Speaking of teachers that end up being horrible assholes, we have Higgle Miss Wiggenstaff, brother of Hieronymus Wiggenstaff, 
who we're not going to talk about in depth because the only things he does in this story are beat dogs for stupid reason and remove agency for players in combat, and the man responsible for the sidekicks at the school. He gets the title of Horrible Asshole for a multitude of reasons. You see, Higglemas has been stuck in his office for the last 50 years. Remember that demon Grey that wants to kill him? Him and his magically transformed into a dog brother are hiding from him. Higglemas himself is unable to get the things that he needs personally, so he mind controls students to do his bidding for him and wipes their memories. What's that? Oh, uh, sorry, my mistake. He convinces them to help first, and then he mind controls and then erases their memories. See, actually, guys, it's okay that he did that because he got their consent first. I'd like you to listen to Fearbulg's initial reaction to finding out that Higglemas has, from his point of view, been controlling his mind without his consent. Before this, I had nothing. I can go back to nothing. What I will not have is a body that is not my own. I'm sorry if I sound preachy when I say this, but consent made in the past in no way overrides not consenting now. That's not how fucking consent works, Travis. Not to mention the fact that players also bring up the fact that this kind of consent is up for debate to begin with. It, it was all done with his consent, he'll tell you. And, and He can tell us whatever he wants, but you've already confessed that you can alter people's memory. So how are we to know what is true and what is not, even if it comes from our friend's mouth? Higglemiss makes the argument that Fearbulg was the only one he could trust because Fearbulgs are unable to lie, a weird Justin quirk that we'll discuss in greater detail later on. But because he was too open, he was liable to be compromised, which made the mind wiping necessary. Admittedly, there is a kind of logic to it, if you conveniently ignore the other people he's mind controlled. Enter Leon, a fellow sidekick at the school and friend of the players. He was going to get his own section, but Travis forgot he existed in the story for a while, so he's really only important in the context of Higglemiss. You see, in the narrative leading up to this point, the players, and by extension, the audience, are led to believe that Leon noticed something was off at the school and got turned into a bird by Higglemiss to keep him quiet. This was the thing that convinced people that Susan the Bear was actually a person, by the way. We are given clues by Leon as a bird that he was transformed. He dropped a brooch that was given to him by Buckmeister, the hero that Leon works for, during the Imp Hospital mission. This is when we find out that Buckmeister had his memories altered as well, being made to believe that Leon was on vacation with his family. Not only are we led to believe that Hegelmus is blatantly the bad guy, the story doesn't really make sense if he's not. He directly says that he did what he did to Fearbulg because he was the only one he could trust. But he also trusted Leon. He said he turned him into a bird for reconnaissance, even though Fearbulg can literally turn into animals naturally because he's a druid. By the way, Leon stays an eagle until the last episode of the series. Why? Leon also doesn't have the problem of not being able to lie, so Hegelmus can't use the same excuse for keeping Leon quiet. If Leon was in on it the whole time, why did he give the players his brooch as a clue? And what about Buckmeister? Did he consent into having his memory altered so he wouldn't notice that Leon was gone? Why would he do that? Not to mention, the time Leon spent as a bird until the end of the series would have meant he was stuck as an eagle for literal months. Bearing in mind, Higglemiss could have changed him back at any point. What the fuck? Now, I know it sounds crazy, but I have a sneaking suspicion that Travis is really incapable of writing characters that people aren't supposed to like. The fucked up mind control isn't the only thing messed up about Higglemus. He's also a big racist. Which is kinda nuts when you consider that another character, the Commodore, was specifically made to be a racist piece of shit. Higglemus does more racist stuff than the designated racist. Wow. You see, after the reveal that Hegelmus has been mind-controlling Fearbulg, he explains that he's been collecting components to reverse the transformation spell that saved his brother's life. He only needs one more component, a magical apple that has been taken from a magical tree in the middle of two herds of centaur. The players agree to help and... What's that? Oh, right, 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 right. My mistake again. First, he threatens that if they don't help, he'll wipe their memory anyway. What I'm about to say, uh, forgive me, because it is going to sound very threatening, and I do not mean it to, it is just a statement of fact. But, you would not be walking out that door with the memory of this discussion intact. Yeah, that sounded it a little threatening. threatening. Yeah, pretty you know, threatening. Kind of threatening. A little threatening. A little bit. I recognize, listen, I prefaced, I said. God, just fuck this character. Anyway, he needs the apple because they're magic, right? But he goes on and says that while the centaurs use the apples, they only use them for ceremonial reasons and that they don't know the power of it. Everything Higglemas said turned out to be a lie. He doesn't need the apple to turn his brother back. He could have done that at any time within the last 50 years. He actually intends to use the apple to permanently hide from Grey. 
Why that couldn't be the stated goal, I don't know. The other lie was that the centaurs very clearly do know the importance of the apples, because the spirits they pray to are actually real and talk to the players. It really boggles my mind that Travis decided to write this character this way. This didn't have to happen. Either Higglemas was aware that the centaurs knew what they were doing, and made up a racist lie so that the players would feel less bad about stealing from them, or he genuinely didn't and he just thought they were stupid. He's either racist or he was pretending to be racist. Both are very bad. Also, gotta point this out again, all of this is happening in a Dungeons & Dragons game. The idea of trotting out a things these natively coded characters believe is probably just fake plot thread kinda loses a lot of steam coming from a guy who's trying to hide from a literal demon. Just as a quick heads up, when I say natively coded, I'm not referring to computer processing. I'm referring to a character that has characteristics or physical properties that are commonly associated with Native Americans or the tropes they're associated with. Obviously, it's not limited to American natives, but I think Travis's understanding of these kinds of characters starts and stops at Disney's Pocahontas. Anyway, this is supposed to be a magical world where magical things happen. If it's not obvious at this point, I hate this character. Especially because we as the audience are meant to feel bad for him for some reason. It's stated multiple times he just wants to save his brother, that all of his goals were predicated on that. Eventually, there's a sappy reunion between him and Hieronymus. It doesn't land for a multitude of reasons. Number one, he's a manipulating, mind-controlling bigot that nobody but Travis was rooting for. Number two, by his own admission, he could have solved his brother problems at any point within the last 50 years of hiding in his office. And number three, after all is said and done, nothing the players did mattered. They got the apple, but it's never used for anything. As I'm writing this out in my script, I physically cannot remember if it actually mattered at all. Hang on. I just went back into my notes. In episode 20, Hieronymus says he'll use the apple to make the potion to hide from Grey and give it to the players to use. He never does that. Oh, uh, one last thing I'm going to say about Hegelmas. I wrote in my notes, maybe he's being hunted by a demon because he belongs in hell. Good one past me. Thanks. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, that version of me is dead. Demon Prince is a title. You can call me Grey. Grey is a demon that wants war. He doesn't get what he wants, and he's a little bitch. Next! I am chaos. The true masterminds behind everything that... Uh, I guess I do have some things I want to say about Grey. Demon Prince is a title. You can call me Grey. Grey was supposed to be the big bad of the series before the big shift around episode 20. He was disguising himself as Hieronymus after attempting to kill him 50 years ago, playing the part of Headmaster while trying to figure out if he had actually killed him. Why didn't he turn the school into rubble using his army of pit fiends to make sure that they were dead? Because the plot had to happen. Eventually, he got a non-demon minion of his into their office, and disabled the demon wards that were keeping him out. Why did this take him 50 years to think of that? Because the plot had to happen. After he captures the Wigan staffs and doesn't kill them, ignoring his entire motivation for being there for the last five decades, he tells the players that he wants a big war between the human realm and his armies of hell. To be fair, he does give them six months to assemble their army. I have had 50 years to prepare for this war, and so I, to make things fair, will give you six months. That's not as you should give us 50 years if you want to make it fair. Yeah. After that, he proceeds to fuck with every minuscule attempt made by the players to recruit an army. He even says that he... You know, here's, here's what I'm thinking. I... Hmm. I will leave you your troops. But... Yes. I'm just going to slow you down a bit. At a point where they haven't even recruited anyone yet. May I remind you, the only reason any of them are doing this in the first place is because Grey threatened to start killing students if they didn't. I'll kill... 10 students a day until you return. Do I get to pick the students, or do, are you going to pick them? <laughs> Grey also bars Fitzroy from leaving the school unless they get his permission. Obviously, he says this because Fitzroy is the main character. Because every D&D &D campaign needs a main character. That's a lie. None of this matters, obviously. Grey isn't the final boss, because Travis made some shiny new bad guys that were actually in charge the whole time. Travis tries to pull an enemies-to-friends trope out of his butt at the 11th hour. It is very awkward considering the players genuinely don't want to be friends with a demon that wanted to wage a bloody war. Exo, exo, um, bye. I'm leaving now. Goodbye. Any last words? Bye. No, you don't want to say I'm your best friend? Or... Oh my God. You listen to the show. You know that they don't. Next. 
I am chaos. Chaos and order are external entities of chaos and order, respectively. To put their motivations as simply as I can, the world got too nice and chaos is bored, so he wants to have a good old world-shattering demon war to shake things up. He even promises the main characters that they'll win. He says in a variety of dream cutscenes that Fitzroy will become a super cool Thunder King, Argo will be a badass pirate lord, and Fearblog will be with his family on a protective native reserve? What the fuck, you guys? I'm gonna dive headfirst into all this weird tribal shit that goes on in Graduation when we talk about Justin's character, but come the fuck on. Obviously, the characters decline these terms because they're not huge assholes. You're trying to tear down a system that assigns a value to every living being in this world, and that's wrong. I understand that more than you might think. But your solution order assigns a value to a great many number of people, and that number is zero because they're going to die for the future that you want. This doesn't matter because Travis has already decided that the Demon War is going to happen. And regardless of what the players choose to do, it will be the end goal. What's worse is that Travis lets them waste their, and by extension, the audience's time. The boys plan and execute a heist against the Heroic Oversight Guild in order to try and change the dynamics of the world without a huge body count. The idea being that the world will become chaotic enough that it will satisfy chaos. Listen to how excited they are about this plan. This is the great watchword today, my friend. All right. <laughs> We're talking about so far. One, blowing up the guild. Two, blowing up the school. So... Three, he... blowing up the economy. Yeah, top that. Okay, then we need... It's going to be really tough for just the three of us to do it. But I know somebody who might be able to give us a, an aid. I do too, and if we're thinking about the same person, that's going to be really cool, and if it's I not... I doubt it, because you and I have never had the same idea. Well, let's just do it on the count of three, and okay. we'll say one, two, three, and then say it after three. Okay. One, two, three. Gray. Prince Grey. There! I'll be damned. I'll be damned. Hey, you want to sow chaos? You want to tear stuff up? You want to mess up systems? Get a bunch of demons to do it with you! There'll still be chaos. He'll get what he wants. But more than that, we have a pretty significant bargaining chip that we can finally, finally leverage against that big, big douche. What's this? He's going to lose. Let's report to the principal's office. Way to waste that enthusiasm, Travis. Good job. They end up fighting chaos in the final battle with the help of order. Uh, look, there's this whole side thing where Order is portrayed as this naive kid, as opposed to Chaos, or it might be switched around, I'm not even sure. Fuck it, you watch the show, you know what I'm talking about. Even though they're both thousands of years old. Trying to explain the motivations of these characters is like trying to explain Calvin Ball. It's just being made up as it goes along, contradicting itself along the way. Ultimately, in the final battle, Argo is about to kill Chaos with a magic dagger that he got from Althea. She's not important. But Travis stops time and instead gives the choice to kill them up to Fitzroy, who decides to flip a coin because not even the players can pretend to give a shit about these characters. Argo actively attacking Chaos with a weapon that could kill him? No, says Travis. The designated main character has to make the final decision. Even though he clearly doesn't give a shit because he leaves it up to chance anyway. Fuck you, old man, for trying to do something, you idiot, you fool. Anyway... Chaos gets sucked into Grey's dimension and the story is over. Hooray. What happens to Order? Eh, 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 eh. Who cares? The Commodore. The Commodore is the designated racist piece of shit I mentioned earlier. His crimes include killing Argo's mom a long time ago and calling Argo a wicked cool fantasy slur. Ah, so this is the young spray that I've been hearing so much about. Uh... <laughs> I, it's, yes, it's, it's me, not, not crazy about the terminology, but, uh... Wow, we, and they call this guy a hero? Ha! Social commentary. Anyway, it's actually enlightening once you realize that Travis only considers a character racist if they're actively mean and say slurs to people, and not people who extort the resources of oppressed minorities for their personal gain, like Hegelmas. Hickelmas, we are told multiple times that what he's doing, he's doing because he loves his brother so much. The Commodore gets no backstory, no motivation outside of wanting vague power, he flip-flops allegiances faster than a pelodrum, and we don't even know what the fuck he looks like. He's described as wearing a uniform and smirking, 
Good time as any to bring this up. You see, the McElroys have this habit on not being very meticulous with the description of their characters. The most common explanation I could find is that Griffin and everyone didn't want to pigeonhole artists. Fan artists specifically. This was to encourage everyone's interpretations of how they saw the characters to be valid. I will admit that I can kind of see the good intentions behind this point of view, but also I think it's kind of bullshit. I find it odd that rather than putting actual effort into including characters that a variety of people would relate to in some fashion, which would put them in the position to be rightly judged on how well they did, they instead put the responsibility of having a diverse cast on the listeners themselves. It seems to me that they want their cake and to eat it too. They want the brownie points of having a diverse interpretation of their characters, but at the same time refuse to commit to actually having diverse characters. <laughs> Being told we need to imagine being included is not a great way to feel included, in my opinion. Not to mention, the fan artist thing is a really weak argument. Artists are not, and have never been barred from making art how they want due to canon. That's pure nonsense. You know what else is nonsense? The way the Commodore dies. You see, during the whole worthless heist, we find out that the Commodore has sided with Chaos and has received magical powers. He used to work for Grey, but we're not told how or why he made this change. Regardless, we see he gets god powers from Chaos that make him fly like a jet engine. And that is when you hear the roar of a jet engine behind you. A roar of a what now? A jet engine. I heard that. He then gets the shit kicked out of him by a couple of students in three rounds of combat. I'm going to celebrate his demise with the top five derogatory names for the Commodore. Number five, the Common Dork. Number four, the Comrade Doer. Number three, Commodore 64. Number two, the Commode Door. And at number one, the Commoder. Terran. Terran is a centaur that works for Grey as a mole in the Heroic Oversight Guild in the Archives Department. Terran is not a prominent character, nor is she important or fun to listen to. If you were to go through this big list of characters, you could easily make an argument why I should talk about literally any other side character. But I'm going to talk about her, because I think she's perfect. She is the perfect encapsulation of everything Travis gets wrong about running NPCs in Dungeons & Dragons. I'm going to talk about her because she's fun to dunk on. Also, I've been a very good boy touching on everything else, so I'm going to zag on this one just for fun, okay? Taryn is just a beacon of incompetence when it comes to being made by Travis McElroy. Let me count the ways. I promise this is the only one I'm going to use. I'm not a creative hack like CinemaSins. We are first told about Terran via Grey, her being described as his centaur on the inside of the Heroic Oversight Guild. This is convenient for the players, because their ultimately pointless plan of destroying capitalism conveniently begins in the archives. The players gather their things, and Grey teleports them into a bar in the City of Prosperity, where the Hog is. A mystery centaur woman immediately recognizes them from the Apple mission, and calls out to the guard that there are murderers. Two incompetence points right off the bat. The first one goes to Grey, who has the ability to teleport at will across the material plane, and didn't think to tell his subordinate that there's a new plan. He had hours to do this while the others were getting ready. The second one is because we, the audience, are spoiled that the person calling the guards is in fact Terran. Remember when I said the Gary recap spoiled things? Terran was the one spoiled. The players lock the bar and try to intimidate Terran. She says she doesn't like them because they made fun of her hurt spiritual beliefs and cut off her fiancé's hand. There was a goon named Calhane. He stole one of the magic apples. He got his hand chopped off by Fitzroy. Calhane having a fiancé with a member of the herd was a retcon. Another point for the incompetence tally. The third one is because she apparently doesn't like them because they mauled her fiancé. In a vacuum, that seems like a valid reason to not like someone. But if removed from that vacuum and given proper oxygen to the brain, Calhane killed multiple centaur guards and tried to start a bloody turf war on the behest of a fucking war-hungry demon girl, get better taste in men. She also says she only joined Grey after the Apple incident, which sets us up nicely for the next few points. The boys tell her that they also work for Grey and wave off the guards. It's at this point the boys drop a bomb on her. We, we didn't able. kill, we did not kill Calhane. Grey definitely did that. Like, Wicked did that in front of us, so. Yeah, that's right. Calhane fucking died that day. He was talking to Grey through a magic mirror and he got force choked or some shit. That seemed like that would be the more pressing thing, wouldn't it? Your fiancé dying? That means that Terran would have been recruited after his death. But how does Terran react to this? Surely she must be furious. She's been recruited by the thing that killed her fiancé. She's been manipulated. She tried to get the boys jailed for murder just for hurting Calhane. Her whole world must be turned upside down by this. This is a huge twist and completely throws off the Who am I kidding? She doesn't care. She just brushes this off and continues to help them. 
Well, now that I think of it, she actually doesn't. You see, while she does work in the archives, the exact place they need to go to destroy all the hero and villain contracts, you know, all of the capitalism, and she has the exact kind of access badge they need to get past security. I mean, the, the ramp is over there. Um, you're going to need an access badge because those are scanned. Can we borrow yours? Uh, then I wouldn't be able to get down there? Can you just go down there and blow it up or something? That would actually be pretty sick. It's not my mission. This is your mission. I'm watched. You need to... Okay. <sighs> Are you fucking kidding me? What's the point of this character, Travis? She's a mole employed by a demon. Why is she not helping with this plan? She's not going to have a job when this plan goes off, because if they succeed, then there won't be any archives. Honestly, why can't she just do it? After this exchange, she doesn't do anything else. All of the obvious advantages she would be able to offer for the mission are just flat out denied to the players by Travis. What a shit show. Taryn is a great example of Travis absolutely failing to make a character act like they have emotions or a brain. She couldn't have a realistic reaction to the news that Grey killed her fiance because then she wouldn't want anything to do with them. But then Travis also failed to make her useful because he clearly realized that Taryn being there invalidated any challenges that would come from running a heist. So he elected to have her do nothing instead. What if, right? What if Travis actually used these two things together? Like, as a gameplay moment. Think about it. The whole thing plays out like it did. But instead of having no reaction to finding out that her boss killed her fiancé, Taryn was actually mad and just fucking left. I could see that being a very funny moment where the players have to contact Grey somehow and tell him that they're easy in, just quit. Then the heist would be way harder because they don't have direct access. That would have been... Something, a semi-memorable nugget in a role-playing game. Instead, what we got was nothing. Taryn was a waste of a character in an arc that was a waste of time. Enough with the side characters. We've touched upon all the ones that matter in the slightest. And yes, that includes Althea Song. She was a plot device that allowed Travis to generate empty cliffhangers. And when she wasn't, she would have been too useful for the characters, so she immediately becomes worthless as well. She's like a boss in a turn-based RPG that is super powerful when she's an obstacle, but gets nerfed into the dirt when she joins the party. That happens more than once in this series. Let's talk about the characters that Travis didn't make. Sir Fitzroy Maplecourt, Knight in Absentia of the Realm of Good Castle, is a half-elf wild magic barbarian sorcerer played by Griffin McElroy. Everything about this character is a mouthful. Fitzroy's whole deal is he's a pompous jerk that wants to be a knight by going to Clyde Knight's Night Night School. I hope you thought that was rib-splittingly hilarious because he says that a thousand more times. You see, he got kicked out of Clyde Knight's Night Night School because he accidentally turned a teacher into a fish with his wild magic, which is not something you can do within the parameters of wild magic which is a bit like getting kicked out of technical college for assaulting a teacher, then as punishment you get a full ride scholarship at Yale. This makes perfect sense. Yes it does, shut up. It isn't perfect however for Fitzroy, who doesn't want to be a hero, villain, or a sidekick. He wants to be a knight, which is a different thing, because there's a castle involved somewhere. That's actually part of the character that he doesn't know where Good Castle is or if it's even real. Oh boy, you as a listener might say to yourself, I can't wait for this pompous jerk to learn that the thing he wants isn't real. Take his lumps and learn to appreciate what he does have. Such is the nature of basic character development. <laughs> well, my articulate viewer, that would be nice, but I think you're forgetting one thing. Travis is at the helm. The second uh, Griffin said that uh, Fitzroy belonged to this like knighthood thing that he didn't know if it was real or not, I instantly was like, it is real, and they will be showing up. God damn it, Travis. You Travised all over the joke. This was such a softball character beat. It was handed to you on a silver platter. You probably saw your reflection in the platter, and you got excited and Travised all over everything. Damn it. Ugh. <sighs> not only does this subversion of expectation not land in a funny way, it actively makes Fitzroy a worse character. Griffin clearly set up Fitzroy to be knocked down a few pegs with his behavior, but Travis didn't catch the hint and kept moving him up a few pegs. He kept pegging him. <laughs> I don't think I should keep that, but uh, it's pretty funny though. Travis decided that Fitzroy would be promoted from sidekick to villain. He decided that Fitzroy would become the Thunder King in Chaos's master plan. He decided that he would lead the Good Castle army with no prior experience. And he decided that Fitzroy got to choose the ultimate fate of the bad guy in the final battle, which he flipped a coin for because he didn't give a shit. Travis never punished the very obvious jerk character because he couldn't punish the main character of the series. Side note, for any of you watching that may not know, when playing a Dungeons & Dragons game, DM should not encourage or designate a main character. Unless there's literally only one player, 5th edition is built to be a team game. 
It siphons the fun from the other players because they don't get as much agency or attention in the story. Graduation is a prime example of that. Though on second thought, it might just be the way things shook out because of the players themselves. Justin wouldn't be caught dead actually caring about nerd shit, and Travis wouldn't be caught dead letting his father succeed at something. So I was, hearing... I was successful and I failed. Yeah. I just want to get that right. Yeah. Griffin was also the most enthusiastic of the players, by his own words, because he got to be a player this time around. But you can also tell that Griffin wasn't expecting to be the lion's share of the story's focus, because he clearly didn't think about Fitzroy as a character enough. Granted, he shouldn't have had to, the story should have focused on all three of them together, not just him. Fitzroy is described as, Uh, yeah, so I'm a half-elf, I'm, uh, you know, I look, I look really good, like sexy, handsome, good-looking, <laughs> very sexual, and handsome, uh, good and popular and handsome, uh, and strong. Which is ironic later on, because Griffin says that Fitzroy is asexual. That in itself is not a problem, but it does show Griffin's hand regarding how much he actually prepped for this character. I, I actually am rested. so, I do not think I can make up any more shit. So the rest of the episode, I'm just going to be hitting stuff. Yeah. Because I've, I, 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 that really taxed me to, to my limit of narrative development. Fitzroy does get punished somewhat later on, but it's for a very stupid reason. And it doesn't happen in a setting where it actually matters in terms of the character. When Fitzroy and the gang aren't convinced to go along with Chaos's war plans, he takes away Fitzroy's wild magic. But Brain, I hear you say, Fitzroy is a barbarian sorcerer. His magic is a natural extension of himself. He never made a pact with Chaos to get magic, so he shouldn't be able to take his powers away. And you would be correct, listener. How could that possibly work with an, oh, that's how, that, that's how that happened. Far be it for me to tell people what story beats to have in their own games, but personally, I despise the whole player loses their magic trope. If you as a DM feel the need to take away the thing that makes spellcasters useful, it probably means you aren't challenging them enough. Spellcasters already have a limitation to their spellcasting. It's called spell slots. Taking away spellcasting for a bullshit reason in order to challenge your players makes you look like a huge control freak. Case in point. Anyway, Fitzroy gets drugged by his magic teacher and becomes a barbarian and sorcerer of the storm instead. He spends the rest of the show rejecting his initial motivation, not giving a shit in the final battle, and ultimately decides to become a lawyer. What? Huh. He goes back to Clyde Knight's Night Night School and wants to become a lawyer. I guess he wanted to do something with Fitzroy. After all, after the big fight, he actively rejects Goodcastle. It doesn't make sense as to why he would, though. The only problem he had with them is that he thought they weren't real for about a dozen episodes. I guess Griffin had his heart set on not being a knight for his character arc, so he chose to be a lawyer instead. Go figure. He goes and tells this to Sylvia Knight, head of the law department of Clyde Knight's Night Night School, and she says he can start in the morning. I am applying to Sylvia Knight's Night Law School. Well, there's an official review process and, you know, all of that, but between you and I, welcome. Excellent. We begin immediately. What is it? What is, so what is law even? No, it's, it's 6 p.m. We, you can start in the morning. I heard something about jurisprudence. Well, that about wraps things up. Hang on a second. What is it? What it? So what is law even? No, it's it's six p.m. We you can start in the morning. But no, it's it's six p.m. We you can start in the morning. It's you can start in the morning. A night school. It's a night school. Do you know how many times he said that, Travis? How could you fuck that up? God damn it! Ah! <laughs> Argonaut Keen is a swashbuckling water genasi played by Clint McElroy. Argo is difficult to describe, not because Clint didn't give him character traits. In fact, he's the most fleshed out of all the player characters, mostly because Travis very rarely let him do anything. I should probably say this up front. I obviously have no way of knowing the kind of relationship Travis has with his dad. I'm not gonna armchair psychology their dynamics outside the game just because Travis gives him disadvantage on a roll. I love Argo, by the way. I don't know if I said it. Argo was very fun to DM for. Thank you. All right? Good. Having said that, Jesus Christ, I would hate to see how Travis would DM people he actually didn't like if this is how he treats his loved ones. It is a running joke in the Adventure Zone that Clint doesn't know how to play the game, which might have been true during the first season, but in my opinion, it has sailed past being relevant or even slightly entertaining. Clint has put more time and effort into his characters and gameplay than the other players combined. There, I said it. He's not perfect by any means, but the number of times he gets corrected or chastised for something is straight up infuriating if you pay attention. And I did. You wanna see? You're going to. Here we go!
damn. When put in a really long scrolling list like that, it seems pretty bad. Now, with a little bit of context, these things really only added up to happening once or twice an episode, and episodes originally were recorded like twice a month. Making a joke at the expense of your dad twice a month isn't the end of the world. It very well could be just Travis handling game mechanics like a new DM would. You know, badly. But there is one thing I know has to be deliberate. Travis deciding to actively exclude Argo from the story in favor of focusing on Fitzroy. But well, let me ask you this. Why do you care? What, what does it matter to you whether I decide A in my life or B in my life or column C? What, what is it? What do you care? How does it, how does it impact you? You have influence on Fitzroy. Ah, uh, I see. If you didn't pause dozens of times to read the list of more than 60 transgressions against Clint, let me give you some highlights. Argo is flat out not allowed to barter for a discount when buying a sword. Minutes later, Fitzroy is allowed to persuade himself a free drink at a bar. This isn't horrible, kind of hypocritical, but not the end of the world. Argo's in-podcast Unbroken Chain missions revolve around finding dirt on Fitzroy. This also doesn't seem like a bad choice on the surface. Teammates being cagey about the details of their life can be a good source of drama, but it has the side effect of changing the one thing in the whole series that was made for Argo and making it about Fitzroy. Argo is given nothing to do during transit in episode 25. Meanwhile, Fearball gets to have a character moment with his estranged dying father, and Fitzroy gets to solve puzzles with skeletons and recruit an army. Yeah, it started becoming more egregious in the later half of the series that things like this started to happen. Travis put Argo in scenarios where he clearly had no interest in giving him something substantial to do. Argo's whole character motivation from the beginning of the show was to become a sidekick so that he could gain enough prestige to work for, and ultimately assassinate, the Commodore for killing his mother. This would be hard to do because Travis decided at some point that the Commodore needed to be a final conflict villain, so Argo was never given an opportunity to progress his motivations until Travis allowed it. Here's an example of this. Travis drags out Argo getting a haircut over the course of two episodes, because he wanted to shoo in a Commodore cliffhanger. The Commodore is another plot device by Travis. He is shaped by Travis to fit whatever he needs to be in any given moment. He just shows up during the heist arc for no real reason. He's there because, coincidentally, there's a big celebration commemorating how much people love the Commodore. All he ends up doing is calling Argo another slur, and he reminds the audience that he's still around. In fact, him being there kind of presents a plot hole when we find out why he's actually there later. Okay, Argo and everybody are at the Heroic Oversight Guild to destroy capitalism, right? They destroy the filing cabinets and finish their plan. All they have left to do is escape. They're intercepted by the Commodore, who we find out has switched allegiances from Grey to Chaos. We are not told when or why this happened. Travis smushed him into the story because I guess he wanted him there. Anyway, he tells the players that their plans are not allowed to be continued, and he's going to use his influence as a beloved hero to have them jailed until the war deadline is up. This creates a plot hole of incompetence where the audience is left wondering, hey, why didn't he do that yesterday when they were actively casing the joint? Why would he wait until after they've completed their goals to confront and capture them? This isn't explained, and the players get teleported away anyway, so none of this matters. This could have been a great opportunity for, oh, I don't know, maybe Argo could have used the shitload of people being there to see the Commodore to, you know, maybe they could have been dueling and had like a curtain or something get pulled back, revealing a huge crowd of people, the Commodore cursing and trying to murder a young man. Argo could see him get arrested and have him brought to justice without killing him like he wanted to. Did I mention that part yet? The part where Argo said he no longer wanted to kill the Commodore? Look, since I was about, I don't know, 11 or 12 years old, this has been my goal. The, the, the Commodore betrayed me mother. And yeah, you're right, that led to her death. And you're right, that means... He murdered her. And I have wanted nothing but revenge on, on the man. Yes, you're right. That's why I went to, to the school. That's why I was studying to be, you know, a sidekick. Anything to get close to him so I could, could snuff him out, so I could, so I could murder him. But I'm, I'm not sure I'm the same Janasi that I was when I started all this, that, that I've kind of, kind of seen a, a bigger world and I'm, I'm wondering if maybe, maybe there are more important things I'm supposed to, to do than just kill somebody. 
Travis kinda sorta flat out ignored that bit of characterization Argo had, instead choosing to make the Commodore a mini-boss. Which brings us to, Argo finally gets vengeance on his mother's killer. Travis gets to describe Argo's emotional reaction instead of Clint. Travis decides Argo feels great about murdering him. Vengeance is fucking great, says Travis McElroy. <sighs> I could go on about how Argo gets fucked over for cool moments in the finale, but honestly, just go back and read the list. It's not fun talking about how a player, who clearly put in a lot of effort, had his contributions ignored. D&D is meant to be a collaborative story game. It sucks to dunk on someone who clearly didn't get to contribute as much as they should have. It is, however, hilarious and cool to dunk on someone who clearly has no interest in contributing at all. Buddy. Bud. Fitzroy 2. Big friend. Pal. Ippy. You, Furby, Dr. Mushrooms, Fiscal Responsibility, Fisk, Jerry, Gary, Grimlow? Really? Fuck it, just Fearbulg. Fearbulg is a Fearbulg, and a druid of the forest played by Justin McElroy. You might be wondering, what's with all the aliases, Brain? You see, Justin didn't want to name his character, so he let the other players choose for him. Well, he said he was going to do that, but then he turned down literally everything they came up with. Eventually, the other players thought there was a story reason for Justin turning them all down, and then they just stopped trying. This would be really funny if it weren't true, but it is, so it's only a little funny. Does the Fairbog actively not want a name, or is it just a matter of not finding the right one yet? Um, so this has been a really interesting thing because the Fairbog doesn't ha did didn't have a name. And because his culture doesn't, they don't do it. And the most of the names that they started out with using were so bad mm -hmm. that I could only push against. And it, and it just like they kept posting up such dog shit time and time again <laughs> that all I could do was stand in front of the hoop and just swat the attempts out of the way. And then eventually they stopped trying, which is sad for me because I, th I figured he would have a name. I am kind of bummed out that like, Master Fearbog or just the Fearbog has been like the 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 nomenclature that everyone has sort of settled on. I I actually have a note. <laughs> I actually have a note on the whiteboard that says no Fearbog names. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, what's even weirder is that Justin did have a name in mind. It was Grimlow. Why didn't he just say that from the beginning? Fuck you. That's why. You did this to yourself, Justin. You deserve to be upset about it. All right. I'm just going to lay my cards out on the table. I think Justin is the worst player in the Adventure Zone. I know, I know. Hear me out. Sure, Travis as a player can be insufferable because he never shuts up. He always tries to win no matter what. He always has to be the center of attention. He actively fucks with the DM's plans. He cheats. I just, I just, if you're logged into D&D Beyond, Argo King yep. rolled an eight. Just rolled an eight. Wow, oh, well, that's now I gotta awesome. log into D and D Beyond. I guess I've been waiting for them to. Uh, this is so great. We should we should definitely use this and keep each other honest with it. This is huge. This yeah. Is, all right, everybody, you're hearing it live here on your number. We can one. no longer cheat. There's no oh, cheating man. allowed. I Not don't that like I've that. Ever cheated. No, I haven't. I've never cheated. Well, you can still cheat, Trav. Unless it's okay, good. Story. I love cheating. I will fudge slightly, you're fired. but you're, only you are banned. You're banned from the game. Only on cheater. Skill. This whole thing was a sting operation. Cheats McGeats. Get there's the door. <laughs> Take your dice with you. Where was I going with this? Oh, right. Justin being the worst one. Say what you want about Travis as a player. At least he wants to fucking be there. Justin has always been that player that wants to do the least amount of work out of all of them. You can hear that from Justin himself. Playing the Fear Bowl can't be easy. It, and especially early on, it had to have been tough um, because of what we do and the very nature of this is, oh, there's a blank space. Got to fill it with some dialogue. Got to throw oh, in man, a funny joke. Yeah, that's where you're fucking wrong, bud. <laughs> Absolutely wrong. Do you know what a joy, what an absolute delight it is? Okay, this is why playing tacos is fucking hard is because it was all it was all goof goof dilda right like it's all like he, he had to have like the line in the moment that was just self-styled coolest one in the room right mm -hmm. he would he had to be like the smart aleck or the smartest one with the the best one-liner or best singer 
with the fear bog, I could just fucking chill until I have something good and then bring my good shit and then peace out. It is a delight. It is a delight to not carry that weight. You know what a druid can do? Change into a dog and swing a limb. It's fantastic. <laughs> Druids can't do anything. He'll elect to do as little as possible in character. Oh, okay. So I that... will sit and wait. For, sc- for school to start again? or this, this is all I have. Yes. And out of character. Is... is... Is Fitzroy going to be in, like, danger right now? No, Fitzroy is landed safely. Okay. Um, Can I just, like, sit on my turn? Can I pass? Do you, <laughs> you want to, like, uh... Yeah, you can delay an action. I mean, like, I just don't know right now, like, it It seems like we're doing okay. He's also a real negative Nancy about his own progress. And, uh, What's the fear bulb pick up here on, in the fourth level? A couple of, um... Just got a couple of dexterity points. Okay. Hey, that's something. Just got a couple of dexterity points. But big... it's the friends you make along the way. Yeah, just a couple. Just a couple of dexterity points. Not a big deal. You just know, a couple lot, dexos. You get, you get a lot more fun stuff at five. Uh, what about you, Fearbog? Fucking nothing, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so whack. I don't get anything. Got you some... don't get anything. I can like learn a couple of new spells, but other than that, Jack. Shit. Are they fun new spells, Justin? No, I got boring ones to make like your what? show worse. What? Like what? <laughs> like what? what? Like prolonged I... farts? No, like <laughs> like um, uh, super listening, not hearing. Super listening. <laughs> I, I that makes very... you a good conversationalist, right? I I got hyperactive listening. It, like I'm a, I, the person knows I'm like super dialed in. Oh, uh, you receipt can find. Too much. I got receipt finding. It's a, I summon an orb that helps me find a receipt that I lost. <laughs> Oh, I think good. we should. I think we should level up twice, so Justin gets fun stuff. I don't. I don't need your charity. Well, maybe we'll just make Justin six. I yeah, don't. and all. What of if us. just Justin is six? Mm-hmm. I I spend a lot of time leveling up to five. I don't need the pressure of, of on the fly deciding if I'm going to be. I my I don't know fucking Church of the Moon Goddess or whatever sure. dumb Every stuff scene. druids do. Yeah, I uh, not a lot. My wild shape got a little better. But I, uh, I took, uh, <laughs> I took um, a uh, a new feat instead of leveling up an ability. I took Savage Attacker. He's so negative. In fact, he actively lies about what he gets during his level ups so he can sulk. Fearbog, you are up. Great. Um, it's pretty boring over here in Druid Town for level eleven to level thirteen. I basically just. It's boring two. here in Druid Town. I basically just added two more to my wisdom. I bet you got some cool new spell slots, though. Nope. Oh, oh, oh. Maybe you can turn into a, a, a big, uh, no nope. bigger bird. Oh. Any? You, uh, you didn't take any feats? No, I took two wisdom points so I could get up to twenty and have a plus five. Okay. He wants that strong. He wants that strong. He's lying here. He just got access to seventh level spells. To normal players, this would be a big deal. Not to mention, he takes every chance to not be engaged with the show. Yes, I'm going to insist that if you guys want to scheme, I thought this would be fun. (laughs) If you guys want to scheme, you have to do it out of earshot, and I will literally take my headphones off. Oh, yeah, that is fun. Or or you could just like give the fear bulb like some ear, ear, like earplugs and take the headphones off. I like he could stay with you, leave him I, inside. I mean, I don't have to go that far, but sure, Trav, whatever fantasy bullshit you want to say. <laughs> okay, uh, Justin, how about uh, I will text you whenever they need you back? Okay. Uh, what do you before you go, Justin? What are you physically doing? Like, what is fear bulb doing to not hear? He's this? um uh just. Uh, putting his fingers in his ears and singing a a old fear bog song. <laughs> Is I have it a body. Dice. I have a dice no. set. We could probably jam some dice in there. Does that sound good? Yeah, I mean, we don't really have to game this out too much. Well, I mean, it's just, it's, it's I was easy looking... to fictionally not hear stuff. Well, yeah. I was looking at my inventory for stuff that we could use as earplugs. And just, I'm sorry, all I got is the dice set. So, are you okay with dice in there? Or <laughs> oh, let's just put some dice in there. Fine. Okay. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a perfect. 
you got cube shaped sort of ear ear cone situation in there. So it's, it's, okay, it's a great. great fit. Are you guys going to scheme? Yeah, let's start Yeah, scheming. we're okay, going to scheme. Right, I'm taking my headphones off. <sighs> and who could forget the classic Justin catchphrase? Let's let's pretend Travis that um a listener when that started, thought this seems pretty boring. I'm going to zone out for a little bit, and then oh. realized at the end that it was important, and they should so have been listening. Like a listener who might have to play the game. No, no. Why would they play the game? They're a listener at home enjoying the show. Uh-huh. I'm just saying for their benefit, maybe you could recap that in in kind of a more concise, okay, uh, the six fashion. Of you? Let me put it this way. When Travis turns in a book report, it reads more like self-fan fiction that's way too long. When Justin turns in a book report, it's his name and a thesis statement stapled to a bunch of blank pages. Which sucks even more when you realize when Justin applies himself and actually pretends that he gives a shit, he's arguably the funniest one there. I know I'm focusing on Justin as a player rather than the character he plays, but there's a precedent for it. Fearbolg is just the ultimate culmination of Justin's preferred play style. If you look back at the long-form characters he's played, they are always the ones that don't want to be there be it Taco and Balance, Duck Newton in Amnesty. Hell, even Rick Diggins from Tiny Heist doesn't want to do the right thing. I hate the children. Fearbolg is apathy condensed into a homogenous mass. In previous games, at least the narrative trucks along whether he participates or not. But with graduation being graduation in terms of interesting things going on, Justin's pessimism is more noticeable than ever. <laughs> Damn it. I thought I was the face. Now I gotta give him my mustache. Well, he's wax. the hair. Now I, guess, I, I used guess to. So. You guys want to know something? I used to get jealous when other actual play podcasts would succeed, often in fashions that seem more pronounced than ours. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know your critical roles of the world, but now like, I feel like I get it at this point. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like you know, it's like. We talk a lot about haircuts and bags of scones and stuff. Probably more than most people <laughs> want to hear about. I think maybe like I get. I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just saying. I get it. You know. Without a good show to coast along on, Justin just comes off as a dismissive jerk, in my opinion. Can I just tell you guys my joke? Yeah, and yeah. yeah. Just remember it. Um, uh, I, 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 I think um that you, if you have to stop playing D and D to go pick up your retainer, you actually regain your virginity. (laughs) You're a new... Oh, Trav, you should leave that in. That's a funny slam. (laughs) He's clearly not having fun. He complains that he doesn't get anything good every time he levels up. When he's in danger of dying, he just says he's excited to get a new character. If you do not exit in under 60 seconds, I will kill the fear bulb. Damn. Well, they're... Nice. I'm going to re-roll a Dark Elf. That'll be... Fucking sweet pyromancer or something. <laughs> cool like yeah. that. Um, and his character decisions seem to be non-existent outside of having moments. What do I mean by that? I'll let Justin explain. Yeah, I, I felt good. I knew I was going to deploy it at some point. I just didn't know. You know, you have some things that you want to try to get to as a character, and I think that... One of the challenges of that, like, I'll give you an example in um, when Amnesty w- revealing that his name was Wayne, I knew his name was Wayne and I knew that it was like a lever I could pull. It was a payoff I could deliver when the moment was right. And yeah. it's finding the balance of like not rushing stuff like that and just trusting that the moment will come. And that when you deploy it, you know, it'll the longer you wait, the more you've sort of built to it. Um, and this is not exactly that because it's not like I left a bunch of like, you know, uh, uh, breadcrumbs towards this towards this song. But I knew that I could use it. I knew that at some point, like it would be part of the thing. Um, the song he's talking about is "On Earth, My Nina." You see, Fearbulk sang this song after we met Fearbulk's dad for the first time, followed by him dying minutes later, and he sung it because he wanted to. Justin's approach to having moments is just really bad. I can understand wanting certain character beats to happen, goals being accomplished and the like, but electing to not do anything until the spotlight is pointed at you is just really poor form, dude. If you want us to care about this, burden of things walking out, burden of things walking out, 
Honored my Nina. Honored my Nina. It really shouldn't be preceded by. Oh, okay. So I that... will sit and wait. For, sc- for school to start again, or? This, this is all I have, yes. I just, that literally put a chill down my spine. All right, maybe we should actually talk about Fearbog as a character now. Which won't be difficult because he only has three characteristics. Number one, he talks slow. This is annoying and is often regarded as a bad decision. I will sleep on the floor. I just got shivers. We have, God, no, we could be playing this game for two years. We're getting two years of that. <laughs> I fully believe this decision was made by Justin to deter other characters from talking to him. Either that, or it could be that he was sick the week prior. Voice was crafted because I was very sick a week before. And then that was the voice that came out. I like my explanation better. Number two, Fearbull cannot lie. This marks the second time that Justin has made a character that has an aversion to being dishonest. The first being Doc Newton in Amnesty. I fully believe Justin gave him this character trait so that he would have an in-character reason to not talk to other people. I yeah. feel like lying is already something that two out of the three of us are pretty good at, and I think the third one of us is not going to get much better. You remember that clip of him saying he was going to take off his headphones? This is an example of that. Oh my god, guys, I'm so engaged with this character. They don't even do the lying thing right. On more than one occasion, Fearbulk not being able to lie is equated to him not being able to be wrong. Just because someone is honest doesn't automatically make them correct. What if they were lied to, believed the lie, and then just repeated their lie thinking it was true? Travis focuses on it so much, there are episode-long classes about teachers getting characters to lie better. Most of them are not fun to listen to, and most of them involve Fearbulk. Can you guess why? And characteristic number three, <sighs> racist undertones. Yeah. We might as well talk about this now. Right, off the bat, I am not native, aboriginal, or of First Nation descent. I am not directly affected by the harmful depictions presented in this series. Quite a bit of what I'm going to refer to is from other listeners who actually know what they're talking about. This topic has been touched upon by users such as History Responsibly. I'll be plagiarizing from them from this chapter because I think they described it way better than I could alone. If you're a die-hard McElroy fan, first of all, congrats on making it this far. Second of all, you probably take umbrage that I would classify anything that the good, good McElroys do to be racist. They wouldn't do that. That's what bad people do. And if you're going by how I assume the McElroys view racism, you're probably right. I will admit Travis doesn't go around saying slurs and murdering people's mothers like designated racist the Commodore. Unfortunately, the exact words escape me that describe what they're doing instead. Ah, what was it? Racist, I guess, a little bit against Valley Centaurs. Um, Kind of weird inflection. Yeah, I think it's more like stereotypes. Yeah. That's it. Stereotyping. That's the word I was looking for. Thanks, fellas. Stop me if you've heard this one before. A politically powerful entity sends out agents to make contact with two indigenous and extant cultures. The colonizing slash intercessory agents are introduced, with their own goal of solving a conflict between the extant cultures they don't understand. These agents openly mock the indigenous cultures, who are also depicted in over-the-top caricatures. The intercessory agents are able to, through a deus ex machina that also mocks the sincerely held religious beliefs of the indigenous cultures, solve the conflict in a way that makes the extant cultures look, subjectively, stupid. The agents literally destroy a precious relic of the extant cultures for their own gain. It is done so in contempt, in front of leadership figures of the native coded cultures. There are no consequences for these actions, and it was later revealed that this was an inconsequential plot point, and that the fabric of these people's sincerely held beliefs are actually a pawn in a game to support the politically powerful entity's agenda. That's more or less what happened during the Golden Apple mission. Higglemas sent out the Thundermen to acquire a very rare and culturally important resource during a time of heightened conflict. After learning firsthand that the customs they follow are not in fact just ceremonial, instead of removing the outside instigator that is Grey's lackey Calhane and letting the centaurs decide how to lead and make their own decisions, Fitzroy takes a bite out of the magic golden apple, spits it out, and tells the leaders of the centaur herds, uh, and I say, okay, now there is one apple, so you can either go to war and kill each other over it, or you can finally, like adults, talk your whole thing over and find a way to govern your herd, maybe together? The centaurs are written to be so stupid that when a bunch of college freshmen literally spits on their leadership skills, they thank them and proceed to resolve a 50-year-long conflict overnight. And of course, Fitzroy fixes the apple so they can still use the precious resource. You know, for Higglemas. 
because we all know that's what's really important. Fuck, guys, this really isn't good. My gut wants to tell me that Travis had no intention of depicting native coded characters in this battle light. Hanlon's Razor, I think he's just a bad writer and didn't think of the kind of message this arc would send out. The problem with that, though, is that everyone has been radio silent on this particular criticism. This wasn't brought up on either episode of the The Adventure Zone Zone, nor was it acknowledged after fans band together and raised thousands of dollars on GoFundMe for the Native American Disability Law Center. As of writing this script, I couldn't find any source of them addressing this. The Native American Disability Law Center is a charity that aims to advocate for the rights of Native Americans, with disabilities in the four corners are enforced, strengthened, and brought in harmony with their communities. As of writing this script, their initial goal of $3,500 has been more than doubled, over $7,000 raised, and it's an ongoing donation. I'll leave a link below if you want to check them out. I think I'll also take a moment and recommend, if you're feeling really generous, anyone watching this check out BeTheMatch.org. This is a non-profit organization that checks to see if you'd be a bone marrow match for anyone that might need a transplant. This one is a personal request from me. I think they do great work, and you very well could save somebody's life. Link for that is also in the description. With that little aside out of the way, centaurs aren't the only native-coded race that gets the McElroy paint job. Fearbulgs are even more so played up as tribal and set in their strange, archaic ways. Fearbulg and his culture are written to be so stupid that even if you ignore the stereotyping, it still makes you say, wait, what? That's fucking stupid. You see, Fearbulg starts off his story having been banished from his tribe for a very serious crime. During the winter, he went out and stole food. And considering that the members of his tribe are already suffering from starvation conditions, not even Fearbulg being the son of the leader stopped him from being... Uh, what is it now? Wait, what? That's fucking st Excuse me. I must make a correction to my description of Fearbulg's backstory. I claimed he stole food during the winter, when in actuality, he stored food for the winter. He got banished from the tribe and disowned by his father because he stored food. Stupid. That's what I was going to say before getting cut off. What the fuck, Justin? Why did you make the Fearbulg's fucking idiots? And yes, this bit of world building is a Justin McElroy original. You want to know how I know that? Justin mentions that he always had the Fearbulg Code of Ethics on the Forgotten Realms wiki page pulled up when they played. Do you know what you would find if you control F the word food on this page? During summer, they stored excess nuts, fruits, and berries so that they could provide food to the forest animals during winter. The word food only comes up one time on the entire page, and it's in reference to how they fucking store food for the winter! They actively made them stupider. They removed basic survival instincts from an entire race of people so that they could have a character arc where a backwoods tribal man could become civilized in the modern world. What the fuck? Listen to Justin talk about how he sees it. He was banished for recognizing economics, like basic economics, of like hoarding berries for the, the tribe when berry supply is high and saving it for when demand is high but supply is low. And by recognizing the that basic economic concept is how he got himself banished from the tribe. Storing food is basic economics? What the fuck are you talking about? Squirrels do that shit. Woodpeckers, ants, fiddler craps, fucking bees. Storing food is just basic shit in nature. Human beings have been storing food since at least 12,000 BC, you dullard. And, and, this shouldn't even be a problem in the first place. You remember how this is supposed to be a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons game? I know how easy it is to forget these things. The brothers have a hard time as well. And it's gonna be some D&D-ass D&D. &D. Ah! I'm gonna roll so many fucking perception checks that our audience is going to shit. My rolls are unstoppable this game. This is going to be some dungeons and dragons. I got, well, I actually have neither, but... Fearbulg is a druid. He was a druid before the story even started. Even at level one, he would have had access to a little spell called... Goodberry. Fearbulg, canonically, could have magicked up enough food to feed 20 people a day. Why were they starving? On more than one occasion, they reference how people in his tribe were starving. How the fuck would that happen if they had druids? Fearbulg's backstory doesn't work logically, thematically, or even mechanically. It's a fucking mess. It's not helped by the fact that the few character moments Justin chooses to participate in are just some really uncomfortable stereotyping as well. Things such as Fearbulg getting a headache being taught basic math because he's a guy who lives in the woods, actively being taught to lie as a means of financial leverage, and worrying that people might think it's strange to see a Fearbulg that has a job. During the hog heist, Justin made it a point to say he was worried that people might notice that a Fearbulg was walking around. Travis agrees that it would in fact be weird for a Fearbulg to have a job. I'm gonna clarify something, Trav, actually, before I do this. Um, am I, I feel like because of my race and my culture it, that I am going to be like 
it would be like insta fail were I spotted at Hog. Is that, do you think that, that does that jive with your understanding? You mean like world? if somebody saw a fear bulk there, they'd be like, exactly. why is a fear bulk there? Right, exactly, yes. Uh, yeah. No fear bulks live like I do. There aren't, There it's not a thing. Yeah, I would say you definitely stick out like a, a sore thumb. I don't think that that would instantly fail you because I think that there are plenty of explanations that Althea and yourself, or like Althea could give for you as to why you are there with her. People know that she has been investigating the case and, you know, she's done reports uh, okay. and stuff. So I, I don't know that it's instant fail, but yeah, I mean, you, you, you would be very recognizable. Ew. And also, what? They already have a centaur. Terran is in the archives. Why would it be an intrinsically accepted fact that a fearbulg wouldn't have a job, you guys? Is it for the reason I'm thinking? I would hope not. I would have to get designated racist, the Commodore in here to say it for me, because I don't want audio of me saying it to get out into the world. That would be a real bummer. Hey, hey, do you remember what Chaos bribes Fearbulg with in order to start a demon war? Fitzroy gets to be Thunder King, Argo gets to be the leader of the Navy as the Kraken, Fearbulg gets to live on a native reserve. I don't know why you paused there, I had the clip already. You will have the opportunity to not only save berries, but save the fear bulg race without change the world will change around them and soon they will find themselves without enough resources without enough food to feed their young the fear bulg are not long for this world oh god that was worse than i remember it being i want to be done with the fear bulk section but there's so many examples of this shit happening it's driving me nuts it's so nuts it would push me back in space cool glad i got that reference in didn't know where it would end up but now we can move on to more important things like justin's choice of character feats when leveling up fear bulk. at level nine justin takes the savage attacker feat it's not the best or worst feat in the world and hey to the outside observer, it might appear to be Justin actively trying to fix his character a bit for combat. Fights in graduation very rarely last longer than two rounds, unless they have an entire episode dedicated to them. And because Fearbulg isn't a circle of the moon druid, he uses his action to wild shape, more often than not, leaving himself with nothing to do in such a short amount of time. But even by Justin's own admission, God, I, I do attack so rarely. <laughs> so this is especially evident when talking about this feat. You see, he got it when leveling up back in episode 24, but he doesn't get around to using it until episode never. He never fucking uses it. Now, now why would Juice think that this particular feat would work for Fearborg at all? What about this feat made Justin decide that a definitively non-combative character would benefit from having it? What about this feat jumped out to Justin McRoy and said, that would be a good fit for my character that I am playing in this Dungeons and Dragons game? <sighs> Do you want to know how Fearbulg's story ends? After the final battle, Fearbulg leaves the school after it closes down and asks Gary, of all people, if he too could take the name Gary and be part of their hive mind. They accept, and they start a very lucrative financial assistance business. So, in summary, a young man is removed from his tribe against his will and is brought to another culture school. He spends the time at the school having his name decided for him, as well as have all the unique facets of his culture scrutinized by teachers that try to teach him the right way to do things. After a stint of a teacher taking advantage of his body, he assists in teaching other people from other tribes how to behave as well. After being forced into a conflict he has no ties or interest in participating in, he's allowed to briefly visit his dying father before jumping right back into the conflict. Once the war is one, he takes a nice Germanic name and happily joins a literal hive mind of capitalistic endeavors. Hanlon's Razor? It, it's gotta be, right? I'm just gonna assume it is. Better for my mental health that way. Unless, of course, I get blindsided by another one of Justin's characters that was also built on a bunch of problematic stereotypes of another kind of native people, thereby setting a precedent that this was something he intended to do. Wait a minute, why did I write that in the script? Oh no! Finally! Oh. I demand meat! <laughs> Who is this? Who are you? My name is Cardala, little man. Oh, you thought I'd forgotten about Cardala, didn't you, Justin? Well, I can't blame you. Most people have. Irene Baker, aka Cardala, is the superhero character Justin played for the Commitment mini-arc. Think of her like the Incredible Hulk, a mild manner HR consultant with the ability to turn into a huge, muscle-bound racial stereotype of Inuit culture. Hooray! Honestly, I want to move back to Travis and Graduation General. If you want a more detailed explanation of how bad Cardala was, go check out Sarah Zed's video about the McElroys. Her video covers the McElroys and their fans over the years. A good chunk of it is about graduation. I'd highly recommend it. I'm even in it! See? Kinda. Just, uh, no, uh, rewind, you missed it. Good. Just, okay, zoom in a little bit. There we go. That, that, there I am. Look at us! Just a couple of schmoes talking about a podcast. Her and her nice, comfy apartment, and me and my... 
If I don't think about it, it can't hurt me. Now, let's talk about the big dog. All right, where to start? Oh, I know, some unproductive dunking. That'll lighten the mood. If the concept of nepotism was turned into a human, Travis McElroy could pass as their stunt double. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, thank you, thank you. But let's get serious for a moment. I doubt many people would call Travis a lazy creator. If you were to go by the sheer volume of things that Travis has helmed, as well as his track record of participation with the D&D sphere itself, you could argue he's closer to being a workaholic. You don't get the moniker, the most available McElroy, by sitting on your laurels. But the problem is a matter of quantity versus quality. Travis does not have quality. Early on in the series, and for a majority of the year before graduation came out, Travis would enthusiastically talk about how much work he put into the show. But when you get to the show itself, you get to see how he actually spent it firsthand. Here's a question for you viewers out there. What would you do if you were to DM a D&D podcast? Survey says... Prior to graduation, the only time Travis DM'd a 5th edition game was a Max Fun Drive exclusive, Knights. A three-episode miniseries with guest star Lynn manuel Miranda. I do feel if you had seven months of prep time to helm the family podcast, should have practiced instead of writing fanfiction, Travis. Maybe even run a one-shot where you test out the hero and villain system before realizing on air that it doesn't work how you want it to. Or at all. Survey says... Fucking read the books. None of you have any excuse not to at this point. Thanks to Polygon, outside the makers of the game, you've had more time to learn the shit in these books more than anyone else. This game is the bedrock of 80% of your show catalog. You should know this game. You've played it for years. Are you embarrassed? Are you embarrassed that your most popular show is a D&D game? Are you guys still hung up on it being a nerd thing? I know for a fact Justin still is, but all of you? Read the books and ignore 75% of what's in there. That's what we all do. Get with it. Survey says... Survey says, This is solid advice. You have a wealth of people to choose from thanks to YouTube and the internet. Now, who would be a good fit? Uh, also, thank you to Kate Welch, Brandon Lee Mulligan, Matt Mercer, Satine Phoenix, Chris Perkins, and Griffin McRoy for being my DM mentors. Oh, cool. For no reason in particular, let's hear some advice from Brandon Lee Mulligan. In graduation, I'd set up all this stuff and the system that I wanted them to break, right? And you, you were the one who said to me, like, have you made it clear to them that the system needs to be broken. And I was like, no, I, I want them to just figure that out. And it's like, no, you need to have like at least one NPC say like, this system sucks, right? Oh, uh, Travis, that's not how you, Never mind. Even if Travis disregards direct advice, certainly he picked up a few pointers from watching other- I'm just saying I get it, you know? I get I it. I haven't listened to other actual play podcasts. Huh. Kind of seems that Travis loves to gush about how much work he puts into something, but then not actually do the work. That sounds like sloth to me. Okay, I think the seven deadly sins aren't all gonna have a one-to-one -one example when it comes to Travis DMing. Instead of recognizing that the thing I want to do isn't working and changing it to one that does, I think I'll just keep using them as a theme without them actually being relevant to what I'm saying. Ho <laughs> ho I learned that one from watching you, Travis! Anyway, everything about graduation is toothless and boring, and every time it threatens to be interesting, it immediately subverts your expectations by being boring, actually. It seems like every major source of conflict just kinda shits the bed and dies before it actually becomes a problem. Oh man, there's a Zorian in the mind. We gotta be smart, otherwise it could kill- Oh, no, wait, he's actually peaceful and he just wants to go home. We're finally gonna confront the guy who's been mind-controlling Fearbo. Oh, hang on. Turns out he actually consented to it somehow, and now we're working for him. Oh god, the Commodore is a member of the Unbroken Chain. How could we possibly- Oh, never mind. He got convicted of murder with no evidence two hours after we met him. Uh-oh, Fitzroy got cursed. Argo's gotta do something. Oh good, an NPC with the exact MacGuffin needed to fix the problem at the end of the episode. Oh no, the players are actually gonna have to fight something dangerous for once. Oh, look who's here. One or more NPCs to do the actual fight while they run away. This one is vague because it could be referring to multiple moments in the show. More than half a dozen, in fact. Even the combat is toothless. Travis has no idea how to balance a fight for three players, or any number of players for that matter. There's only two modes of combat in Graduation, a plural number of generic enemies that die in one hit, or bosses that have hilariously little health. Oh, actually, there's a third type. The, it's a cutscene, players have no control over the outcome kind of fights. Okay. 
hey, is this like one of those uh, Final Fantasy fights that we're supposed to lose, or what's up? Uh, I mean, is any fight a fight you're supposed to lose, Griffin? Oh, it's deep. Uh, the third kind happens all the fucking time, because God forbid there's any challenge in an RPG that mostly focuses on combat. Can't have that. Even in the combat itself, Travis just gives up and lets things happen that invalidates any kind of challenge to begin with. Oh, did you hit this enemy with a regular attack with your maul? They're stunned now and they can't take their next turn. You're fighting an ogre and cast Charm Person on it? Ogres aren't considered humanoids, but it's the only time Justin has participated this episode, so we'll let it work. What's that? You're casting a spell that does exclusively fire damage against a bunch of hellhounds? Creatures that are made of hellfire and are literally immune to fire magic? Eh, fuck it. It works. Who cares? Edge of your seat action! And all the named bad guys have to have some kind of, oh, they're actually really nice moment of the character. I don't think we've had a lot of, like, truly hateable characters. That means all the big bads end up with the same twist. Zorn in a cave? Actually nice. Hegelmiss, who mind controls students? Actually nice. Gray the demon that wants to wage a bloody demon war? XO, XO. Um, bye. I'm leaving now. Goodbye. Any last words? Bye. No? You don't want to say I'm your best friend? Fuck off! Gordy the Necromancer? Actually nice. And he smiles, and you're instantly confused. And he says, May I interest you? And he raises the tray. In a scone? <laughs> the literal concept of chaos? Actually nice because order is there to take over their body. Even designated racist the Commodore canonically is one of the most loved and celebrated heroes in the world. Travis is physically incapable of making characters that people are not supposed to like, which makes them terrible characters and incidentally makes people hate them. Funny how that works. Travis is, to put it a nice way, a very confident individual. If I wanted to put it in a mean way, Travis is an arrogant, performative husk of a creative that only has the modicum of admiration that he does because his more successful siblings decided to monetize socializing with their family members because they had no other reason to talk to him otherwise. If I wanted to be mean, of course. Travis's style of DMing is like a stage director chastising actors for not reading the script they never received. There are so many moments where entire scenes grind to a halt because the players aren't given anything to work off of, or Travis's expectations are so out of left field you'd have to read his mind in order to guess what he had planned. It's tilapia. I chucked the tilapia jerk three inches of tilapia jerky right at that silly cat. Meow. What do you want from this kitty? I don't fucking know. You threw it in my path. <laughs> I have no quarrel with this cat. You just put a cat there. I talked to the cat. I know. I know. I have nothing for this cat. <laughs> I mean, so far, I'll say, uh, Travis, in the transaction, the cat's up. The yep. cat's up some jerky. The cat is up. So let's bump back over. It certainly doesn't help that Travis has a super loose grasp with the rules of the game which makes it almost impossible for the players, or the audience, to parse out what's important to pay attention to. There are points in the story where Travis gives the players information, or something to chew on, but the second they try to inquire about it, it becomes clear Travis had no intention of actually having a concrete answer. Like how in episode 10, one of the Garys makes a big stink about how the room is haunted by a ghost, only for Fearbolg to cast Detect Magic to see if that was true. This really annoys Travis because there are methods for his players to get definitive answers. Okay. Uh, there is definitely some, like, spectral traces and leavings. You know you can't lie. You can't lie. You know that, right? Yeah, but what am I supposed to do? There's ghost magic everywhere? There's definitely some ghost traces. There's a cold spot, and, uh, the clocks don't work. And, uh, you see, I don't know, a small child at the top of some steps or whatever the fuck. The room is haunted. In our room? No. So they're ghost steps, too? They're steps of the mind, Justin. Okay. This is exhausting. This specific example happens more than once. Both Griffin and Justin have access to the same spell. Every time they use it, Travis is vague and refuses to give them helpful information. He probably did this because it puts the onus on him to react to player choice rather than faffing around until they read his mind about what they're supposed to be doing. I guess Travis takes too much in his work to let that happen. 
I just stopped myself now as I'm writing the script. I realize that I could write thousands of words about every problem that Travis has as a DM. Some of you watching might even want me to do that. I know some of you really want me to do that. I could go on about how the pacing was dreadfully slow, but also that at the same time, the continuity of time passing was like time travel. I could talk about how Travis was in love with his own characters and play that weird sexual groan when Griffin brought up Leon that one time. I can do that myself. And I pull out my Falconer's Gauntlet uh -huh. and, summon, and summon Leon. Oh, yeah, you do. I could talk at length about how in order to have a story about critiquing systemic capitalism, the problems the players face need to actually be a result of the systemic capitalism, and not demons from another dimension that are sad because there's not enough genocide going on. I could type paragraph after paragraph about how Travis has no idea how to dole out magical items in a fair and satisfying way. I could write for literal days about how bad Travis is as a DM. But I think I boiled it down just now. I think more than anything, Travis doesn't want to get better as a DM. I would bet that he doesn't think he has to. Why would he? He already won. According to him, he told the story he wanted to tell, and he's really proud about how it turned out, guys. And I think by the end of it, it got to a place that I was very, very, very proud of. He's proud of all this. Now, I can't speak about another person's problem with narcissism. So I'll let Travis do it. Which now I think is also pretty narcissistic, but also very on brand for me. Like you said, the the, the DM is doing 99% of the work. When I'm doing a scene, like lines will pop into my head that are very effective and seem scripted if I could toot my own horn. But like I just made up the scenario, I made up the reaction, I made up everything right there in that moment. And I have the ability to say it with such confidence that it seems like I always had that planned and that's what I was always working towards. Now, it's not the end of the world to be narcissistic, but I would be lying if I didn't think it was a factor as to why this season was terrible. When you're a dungeon master, your job should be to make sure that everyone in your group is having fun. If you have delusions that you're supposed to win, even though you're the one setting all the rules, that's clearly going to be an issue. It would be bad enough if this was just a casual home game, but with the added pressure of it being arguably one of the most well-known D&D podcasts out there, you don't get a pass for these sorts of things. You don't get to run your first game ever, actively ignore good advice, don't take the time to actually prepare, and then pretend that people didn't like it because it was a matter of preference. I think the tricky thing is trying to find a balance uh, between like subjective and objective feedback because yeah. you know everybody has different things that they're interested in and things where they're like I want more of this and it's like okay cool I understand you want more of that but does that actually like contribute to the quality of the product or is that just your personal you know your personal aesthetic your campaign sucks you're allowed to say that by the way Travis you're not going to burst into flames and keel over if you do. Just say graduation was the bad one, and it'd probably go a long way to bring back fans that you lost, if you care. And hey, you had everything going against you. You had your condition, you had COVID going on, you were inexperienced, you had a kid. Keep in mind, none of these things make your show good. But like, what happened to the McElroys that just acknowledged that they were bad sometimes? Y'all just flat out warned people not to listen to the first 200 episodes of my Bim Bam. Hell, even back in Balance, you went back and recorded episodes because you thought you could do them better. What happened to that? Are you done trying to get better? Certainly feels that way. I think I'm done. If this last part seems a bit rushed and shorter than I made it out to be initially, it's actually because it was an intentional deep cut satire about how the finale of Graduation was rushed. They had to abandon ship for their next campaign in the hopes of getting more max fund donations. But yeah, I think I've talked about everything I wanted to. I wonder if I should have talked about all the times Travis asked his fans to post links to their OnlyFans.
property, so I'm stuck over processing every goddamn thing. I gotta take that time to catastrophize and break apart and analyze every tiny thing that comes to mind. I'm going off with the fucking time. Yeah. Passing interaction leads me to a bad chemical reaction. Wanna be a better person? I try to be, but I get held up by anxiety. Don't wanna convince myself they hate me, but then I cope by getting angry every time I fail to contain the edge. Fuck it, time to hit the switch. Back in paradise, love in the rage, bubbling over like every day. Do not believe what the people who try to be happy no matter my troubles they face. Put on a face like everything's great. I can erase that I really hate the way they try to say that I should live my life and live a day. Feeling the pain of all mistakes, you prefer each time I fight a fear. I'm really stuck on a cycle of panic, I'm out of analysis all the time. Slow down and breathe, calm down my mind, lie to myself and sing. Everything is fine. It's all done. It's all done. Took a long time, but I did it. I did it. So I'm gonna try and go at this without a script or cutting or just like try to go in one go. Probably sound better with a script, but screw it. I said all of what I wanted to say. But uh, thank you for uh, listening and watching if you did and you made it this far. It took me a long time to make it and uh, read and write and all the stuff that I wanted to do. So uh, thank you, everyone. That seems to have given a shit, so. Uh, I'm adding this extra bonus onto the last of it, just because uh, I wanted didn't really cover this in, in the uh, original video, the, in the whole thing. Uh, I just, I thought it would be a good ex time to uh, just explain why I made it. Like, why I made, like, like a two-hour video about a podcast that apparently I really don't like. And uh, what motivated me to do that and just kind of like, like what would possess me to do that sort of thing. And like, I, I asked myself that like a lot making this too, but uh, I think it just is like a personal thing. Honestly, I don't even think that like, like a flip of the coin, uh, it would have been something else. I, it wouldn't have been graduation specifically or Travis or any of his work. It's just like, just a, a matter of chance that it's just like the thing I kind of latched onto for when this happened. So uh, if I were to put this concisely, uh, a bit of a content warning beforehand, I'm going to talk about uh, my cancer diagnosis. I was diagnosed with uh, acute myeloid leukemia at the age of uh, 29 back in uh, December 2020. So originally my, my uh, initial goal was to get this video done on December 9th. Uh, that was my original goal of like posting this because that would have been my uh, uh, anniversary of my diagnosis. So, you know, that would have been nice. But uh, I'm just going to put this verbal content warning saying that like, oh, I'm going to talk about having cancer. And that includes like talk about like needles and blood and stuff and just like transfusions. I'm not going to talk about having cancer. I'm just going to talk about 
how cancer kind of influenced the making of this. Because it's just like, yeah, no. It more or less just this whole video is just an excuse for me to like pour all the negative energy that I had during that whole uh, procedure and like all the chemotherapy into one video or like into one place because obviously I didn't want to like put it out towards the people I care about and just kind of like people like uh, and like my life my, my friends and my family just kind of like yeah no I, I don't want to be this negative around them but uh, yeah so Travis by sheer dumb luck you've become my uh, cancer punching bag and I'm going to explain why uh, and honestly fun fact it was either this or it was going to be like One Piece I remember okay I'll, I'll start from the beginning you see uh, back in early uh, 2019 I think it was like February uh, I used to live uh, near my old apartment. There used to be this uh, plasma place where you go and give their uh, plasma just for in exchange for cash and money. But uh, I would go there and just be like, oh man, I can spend an hour here. Uh, feel like I'm going to be helping somebody and I get paid. Fuck yeah, I'm going to come here all the time. And I, I did. And uh, coincidentally, uh, because I was there and I was finding myself like, oh, I'm going to be sitting in this chair for like an hour. So every time I come here, I probably should like find something new, just kind of like to start a new series or something like that. So it was either going to be one piece or it was going to be this podcast that I heard about a friend of mine talk about. It's like, oh, you should listen to my brother and my brother and me. It's like, oh, I, I haven't heard that before. So, and I ultimately listened to my brother, and my brother and me because that way I didn't have to like look at my phone the entire time because I didn't have like a a phone uh, case on my phone. So I would have to like physically hold it the entire time. Just like, eh, I don't want to watch. I don't want to hold a phone for an hour. I get lazy. So my brother and my brother and me were was it. And that was my <laughs> introduction to the McElroy universe. And I, I thought it was hilarious. I started it like, uh, I don't remember specifically what episode I started at, but he definitely, the friend of mine, he definitely told me to start at like episode like uh, 250 or 300 if you really like want to push it. So that's what I did. And uh, I would say it definitely became my go-to for like when I was out doing stuff and just kind of like going about place to pace and just like tw twice a week at least. I would just like sit there and uh, listen to the show like, oh, hey, the episodes are like an hour and like I'm at the plasma place for like an hour. So it just worked out. I, I listened to, uh, the entire back catalog of my brother and my brother and me. And then once I was finished with that, I was just like, Oh, Hey, they're, they have these other shows. Uh, and it's called the adventure zone. So I also listened to that in its entirety while getting plasma done. So that lasted from early 2019 until late 2020. So it's like a solid two years of, uh, almost daily, uh, my brother and my brother and me and just McElroy content in general, just kind of like, oh, hey, I'm, I'm always out doing stuff. I'm always out like, oh, I need to go on a walk or I need to go uh, take care of some things. And just like, that would be the thing I would put on because there was just like this huge backlog and I thought it was funny. So, and uh, obviously come late 2020, December 9th, uh, I went in to get plasma done and uh they they do this little uh blood test where they prick your finger and like they test the uh the contents of your blood before they tell you that before they let you like donate and they told me that like hey your iron is low for some reason like it like we can't do it with this uh we, you can't donate with uh this composition of your blood so you have to like get a note from your doctor saying it's okay just to be sure that everything's okay it's like oh okay cool so i then went to a uh, walk-in clinic and i got a blood test done there and they said that hey uh your blood's I, like your blood comp is weird we're gonna have you uh, go to the hospital and get a bone marrow biopsy so, like in a few days it's like oh okay that might suck because they were uh i talked to the doctor beforehand and they said like oh it might be mono or like worst case scenario it might be like cancer but like we're we're pretty sure it's mono. It's like oh okay. Well, I I I thought that sucked honestly because like it was just like oh man, I'm gonna have to like get a fucking prescription and like take it for like 
three weeks? Fuck me, this sucks. But then, uh, on December 9th, 2020, I was sitting on the toilet, taking a shit, and I was listening to, I think the episode was like, episode like 538, like Mopitone Drippy Shoes or some shit like that. It was, I was listening to my brother, my brother and me, and uh, I got a phone call from my doctor saying that, hey, you need uh, to go to this hospital in another state because we don't have the facilities to keep you alive. You have acute myeloid leukemia. Your, your room's already like booked for you. It, it'll be open at like two o'clock. And I'm like, oh shit, I have cancer. And uh, yeah, long story short, I, I went there. I spent my first round of chemo there for like three months, just like living in the hospital. And then I was able to go home and I was able to get my chemotherapy uh, in clinic, meaning I could just like, I could stay, I, I was living with my parents at the time because they were, uh, they lived in the city that the hospital was at. So that was a nice uh, benefit that I was able to uh, lean on them being a, like, they, I, I stayed at their house while I was getting the rest of my chemotherapy. So uh, I got all my, the rest of my rounds of chemotherapy in a clinic where I just like every two or three months I would go in for another week of chemo and then just like be sick as a fucking dog for the next two months. And then just like, as soon as I got even a little bit better, I went back for another round until I got enough rounds until they were say like, Oh, Hey, we're, we're done. And then we're just going to call it good for now and just be like, Hey, we're going to check you every like couple weeks and then every few months make sure that it doesn't come back. My uh, last round of chemotherapy was uh, July 14th of uh, 2021. So as I'm recording this, it's been about a year and a half since I finished chemotherapy. But uh, the way the doctor prescribes it is like, oh yeah, as soon as like the, at the start of first chemotherapy is when we uh, call it, like you have you're clear of cancer. Cause like they want you to be like, like completely clear of any sort of like cancer cells, uh, with acute myeloid leukemia specifically, I was very lucky to have like the kind of, uh, cancer that's just like, it, it's the most curable. If you could call it that, where it's just kind of like, Oh, Hey, uh, if you have, if you go through chemotherapy and, uh, there's no signs of it within like five years of you, like your for from, from like your first dose to chemo, and then, like, after five years, if you don't get it again, you're probably never going to get it again and just say, like, uh, you're cured. Would be, mostly because, like, acute myeloid leukemia is so rare. Because, like, I'm 30 years old, and, like, the idea of, like, somebody getting AML uh, at the age of 30 is very unheard of. Because the most people that, like, get uh, AML are, like, toddlers that have, like, underdeveloped bones or... Uh, people over the age of 65 who have already been through some kind of chemotherapy or radiation treatment. So that, that was a fun thing. Uh, I participated in like three or four blood tests uh, just at, voluntarily because like, hey, you're a 30 year old with AML. Can we have your blood? Just like, cause we have very little like reference for that sort of thing. It's like, uh, yeah, sure. That's fine. But uh, explanation aside, how does, what does that have to do with the, uh, uh, the McElroy's and my brother and my brother and me. Well, uh, I would say that it, it's a bit Pavlovian. If you don't know what that means, there is this uh, scientific experiment done by this guy named Pavlov where he would, like, uh, feed dogs food and then ring a bell, right? He would, like, put food in their bowl and ring a bell. And they would be like, oh, yeah, food. And they would start to drool because they were being fed. So it's a uh, scientific uh explanation for like association with things where it's just like uh where people were dogs and but also like other things where it's just like you, because one thing happened while this other thing happened you would associate with it right so it turns out after two years of uh basically donating plasma i had like kind of started to associate subconsciously I didn't really think of this until like I was already like more than halfway through my chemotherapy, but like I had been associating with, uh, getting poked with needles and like seeing blood with 
these kind of good feelings by just sort of like osmosis of being donating to plasma. Because like number one, uh, you go to plasma, uh, you get you get paid money. You, I I was I'm a big guy. I got like the biggest sort of like donation pool. Uh, there were times where it's just like during COVID, there were like like months where it's just kind of like, hey, every time you come in here, you're going to get 60 bucks for sitting here on your phone for an hour. It's just like, holy shit, that's, that, that was some good spending cash, if I'll let you know. But like, uh, I can't really do that anymore because I had blood cancer. So I'm pretty much barred from that forever. So, so I would go in there, I would get stuck with a needle and then I would associate that with like, oh, I'm getting paid. And then after I got paid, I would normally, uh, get like a cheeseburger because like, Hey, I just made 60 bucks and I've also burned 500 calories from like donating plasma. I can go get a cheeseburger and it's like a guilt-free cheeseburger that I don't have to like go work out. So it's just like, cool, you get paid and I got a cheeseburger, but also I got to listen to like a funny podcast that I was really enjoying. So it was like a three pronged tech where it's just like, uh, like you got paid money. You got to eat a cheeseburger. You got to listen to a funny, uh, uh, podcast, but also, and this one is just like a personal thing. It's just kind of like, oh, I'm gonna be a little emotional about it. But like, I, 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 I it genuinely made me feel better because like I thought I was helping people, right? Where it's just like that. That's all plasma does. It's not like, like, oh, you're donating your blood to like make like cosmetic, like makeup or some shit, you know? But like, literally, it's just like you're you're making medicine for people that like need to stay alive. I. I, I received a lot of plasma while I was getting chemotherapy because like uh, one of the things about chemo specifically, how it works is it just kills your bone marrow. And like that was the thing causing me cancer. So they just killed my bone marrow for like a year and a half. And I had to get like almost daily doses of like blood and plasma because my body wasn't able to like make its own. So, so it was like four things. It was like, I got paid big money. I got to have a guilt-free cheeseburger. I got to feel like I was helping people and I got to listen to a funny podcast. So that was nice. And because I had been doing that for two years, I was associating, uh, with those four things, but then I got cancer. And, uh, obviously if you're, if you have uh, blood cancer specifically, uh, you get stuck with needles a lot. I had a pick line where it's just like, there was like just a tube in my arm for like, like for like three months at a time before like they changed it out. But like, I literally just had like people taking my blood every other day. Not, not every other day, like every four fucking hours for like the first three months. And like they, but they couldn't get it all from the one port because like one of the things you have to be aware of when you're, uh, in a situation where you're like immunocompromised, where you don't have an immune system, which happens when you don't have bone marrow to make antibodies, is that you need to be checked every four hours for uh, infections. Because uh, if you get an infection in you and they don't catch it immediately, then it very well could kill you with the fever. And I, I wanna say that like definitely at least four times in my life, I during that whole procedure, that I was sent to the hospital because I had a fever. And like, I, if I hit over 102, I would have to go to the emergency room and say, Hey, I need to go to the cancer clinic and get like some fucking help. So, uh, that, that, that was kind of the situation I found myself in where for two years I was associating subconsciously the idea of like, oh, hey, I got, ow, I got stuck with a needle. But then it made me feel happy because like, oh, you get money, you get a burger, you get them to feel like you're helping somebody and you get to listen to a funny podcast. But then I got cancer and then I was getting stuck with needles every other fucking hour, but those things meant different things now. But so instead of whenever I got stuck with a needle while I was getting chemotherapy, that means uh, I wasn't getting paid. I, it, I was in the hospital. I was my first, uh, stay, uh, thank God for like insurance and stuff. But like, I was going to be cost like over $200,000 for like, I was there for two months or three months. And like, I was being charged hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's just like, okay, every needle that we stick with you, it's just like debt, debt, debt. And then one, another thing was that like chemotherapy, 
being immunocompromised, you don't get to eat all the things that you used to because, like, it might have, like, very small germs on it and, like, it could fucking kill you. So you had to have, like, you couldn't have meats and stuff where it's just like, oh, you can't have cold cuts or, like, there, there was a whole, like, uh, laundry list of things I couldn't eat. But it's just like, oh, yeah, you can't have fresh vegetables. You have to have, like, fucking steamed and, like, sterilized shit. And it's just like, it was god-awful. And so that was the second thing, which is like, uh, stuck with needle. I was in debt, and then also I wasn't able to eat anything that I wanted to. And also the fucking nausea. I'm not going to even touch on that nausea because I, I don't want to talk about throwing up for, like, fucking a year and a half. But uh, that was the other thing. And then because I was getting monthly, like almost daily, uh, plasma donations, all the, all the donations that I had like, uh, made over the course of two years, I easily like took in more plasma than I ever gave out like easily. Cause like, even if I went like twice a week and I just gave everything that I had, like I got hundreds of like packs of like platelets and blood and plasma and just stuff like that. So it was like, I, I, it was like in, in, it was, I, I felt bad. I, I, I shouldn't feel bad. I, I should not have felt bad about it, but at the same time, it's just like, I couldn't shake the feeling of like, like, oh, well, well, you're taking more than you gave out there, buddy. You're not like doing a net good anymore. So that was the third thing. And <laughs> during that time, uh, the show that I liked, uh, was not very good because, during my chemotherapy, you know what was on, like, the Adventure Zone? Fucking graduation. So, <laughs> the, the four things that, like, had brought me joy in, like, just this little side hobby for, like, the last two years were now suddenly, like, almost fucking reversed, right? Uh, like, I, like, but my body was still, like, associating with, like, the feeling of, like, getting stuck with a needle with the the good joy of like oh hey you're about to get something good but then there was that there was every fucking time there was this like crushing realization that it's just like oh it's uh it's actually everything's the opposite oh you think you're gonna get paid 60 bucks for being stuck with a needle oh no you're being put into huge amounts of medical debt oh you think you're gonna be getting like a guilt-free cheeseburger no no you're gonna be getting fucking disgusting hospital food there's just like almost flavorless and trash and it's like oh you you think that like you're gonna uh like, you're, you think you're going to be helping anybody with these, like, fucking blood tests that you're given? But like, nope, you're just going to be sucking it up and, like, taking up everything else. So, I think that's why, I, like, I volunteered for all those tests, just to be like, something's f fucking got to come out of this, right? Something has to be, like, a net positive for this fucking trauma, for this shit. And then it's just like, oh, hey, you get to listen to a funny podcast. And it's just like, nope, it's, it's graduation and Travis is in charge. Fuck you. It's like, oh, my God, fuck this. So I'm a little emotional. I mean, like, well, fuck, this whole thing is like just me vomiting out my feelings over the last eight months. I mean, like, I, it's kind of self-defeating. Well, not, not self-defeating. I shouldn't say that, but like. It was kind of like an exercise and just sort of like, it's metaphorically how I kind of dealt with this trauma, right? Where it's just like, I, I have a therapist. I have like a new therapist that I've uh, talked to about this. I I have a support group. I have friends. I have family about that sort of stuff. But like, it, it's just like, I, I never told them this part, right? Where it's just like, I never, like, it never really came up to like, really like explain to everybody that like, oh, hey, the... Like, whenever I get stuck with a needle, it makes me feel sad that the podcast, like, doesn't, isn't good anymore. So it's just, like, there was always, like, more pressing discussions to be had about that sort of thing. So, I'm not editing it. I, I don't plan on editing any of this out just because, like, I, I want this to be one taken. It's fucking New Year's. I want this to be done. So. But, yeah, no, I... This whole thing was just me trying to work out shit that I have been doing. So I think I'm done with that. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm cured of like being sad about having cancer. I'm not gonna be like. I still go to therapy about that. I mean, like, but I'm. I am getting better. I'm like last ninth uh, of December. I'm 
like on my third year now. So in two more years, I'll be able to say like, hey, yeah, no, that that sucked, but I lived through it, and I'm not probably not going to have to worry about it anymore. So, but yeah, no, I. I'm glad I did this. I I also just haven't really been motivated to do anything creatively in this capacity. Because, like, I, I have a degree in digital animation. I, like, a couple years ago, I've been, like, was planning on, like, oh, hey, I'm going to try and make, like, a fucking movie. And I'm going to try and make, like, a, a video game. I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to do that. And then, uh, diagnosis just fucking smacked me on my fucking spine and just like that's what happens when you're like in bed for 14 hours a day just like everything that you like just fucking feels like it's dying out but I'm, I'm getting better at it I'm, I've been improving just been doing like this whole year I've been out of like chemotherapy I still get blood I still get like uh, monthly blood tests just to make sure that like nothing reoccurs but But uh, hopefully sometime this year it, it'll be comfortable enough to reduce that to once every three months instead of once every month so I can think about moving somewhere else because like obviously thanks to COVID and cancer it's just a lot of your plans get put on hold but I'm glad that I got this done and that's all I really can say about it because like I just really needed an outlet for this sort of thing, right? Where it's just like, like I felt like I, I was able to cover a lot of stuff with like the people I care about, but this one was just sort of like one last like personal like issue that just like, it was always kind of like bugging me at the end of the day, where it's just like everything I've said so far about graduation, I, I genuinely believe that, but like at the same time, obviously I would never have like had the motivation to like make a two hour long video essay about it, right? But it's just like, I think it mixed with the idea of like, oh, hey, that that would be something to do, right? That would be something that like you could cover both of them where it's just like, hey, I, I learned a new program for this. I learned uh, more editing stuff. I, I got back into 3D modeling. So I, I think it was beneficial and like, hey, if people hate it. I'm probably never going to do this again. So like it matters. So, but uh Overall, uh, yeah, I think that's more or less why I did it. Just because, like, I had to work through some shit. I'm sorry if this is very, very personal. I did leave some warnings at in the end credits and at the beginning, so hope I didn't gross anybody out with cancer talk. But uh, yeah, I think I think that's it. I've been going for 25 minutes. That'll put me almost at two and a half hours. I think that would be pretty a pretty sizable like uh achievement it will just i mean I, I, I padded the numbers at the end of it with just like some garbage filler but yeah you know fuck it i'm calling it content because it's an explanation as to why i did this so all right well uh happy new year uh if you've listened to this so far uh thank you very much and uh i hope you have a good one and i Thank you for subscribing, I guess. I, I Right now I have like 60 subscribers at the time of doing this. So uh, I thank you, I guess. I, I, I don't want to say I'm never going to do another thing. I just don't really know if there's ever going to be another topic like this, right? Where it's just like, I made this because... I was hap I I was motivated by spite. I, I was so mad about it where it's just kind of like, this fucking guy, he's just like, I was going to... I did it because, like, there was that motivation where it's just like, what else was I going to do? It's just like, e either these feelings are going to stay bottled up forever and be unhealthy and I'm never going to be able to express them. Or I could just put it all out in one place and just, like, be able to, like, put it behind me. So I think this is probably the longest and probably the only uh, super long video essay about graduation that is ever going to be. And nobody can take that away from me. Uh, Sarah... I don't know if you're fucking listening to this or not, but I saw your comment on Reddit to like make it longer so that I could win. So I, I hope you're happy. I've taken the title from like the longest uh, video essay about the McElroys from you. So haha, -ha, I win. Uh, but uh, yeah.
but seriously, thank you everybody that uh, I've talked to online, just in this uh, little little circle jerk garbage place. But like, it's my it's my garbage place. It's your garbage place too. It, it's nice to have a place to be shitty together. I know that sounds weird, but uh, you you know what I mean. But uh, thank you all for your kind words and your uh, your kind words and your motivation and just like your well wishes. So thank you. I'm not going to be going through the list of everybody that I talk to because they're I, I'd be reading, reading out some weird fucking names and I don't want to, the sound of me like talking about it coming off on the radio waves. But uh, you know who you are, so. Thank you. Uh, I hope to see you again. If I ever feel this way about anything again, I might show up and make another one. I might get a better uh, quality mic than this uh, clip-on mic that uh, I 3D printed, like a little slat to go on my uh, gimbal arm lamp, but like, because I didn't want to buy um, like a movable mic stand for like a $16 like corded mic, so. Yeah. I, I know I've kind of like, segued into ending this like a couple times, but I, th I think I really am done. I'm pushing like half an hour or so. Thank you everyone uh, for, for listening, for saying nice things about it. And uh, you'll, and if you didn't like it, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't mean to, <laughs> if you enjoy this show and you enjoy the McElroy brothers, even after everything I've said, I'm not gonna, I'm not trying to take this away from you. I'm not saying that like anything I'm not saying you're wrong for liking it. I'm just putting myself out there because I've gone through a lot of shit this year so and last year. But uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, if you didn't like it, I'm probably never going to do this again, so don't worry about it. So happy new year, and I love you all. Have a good one. Bye.